All right, so we're going to try something new here. We're going to do a little bit of a, a pre-show show. Preamble? Preamble. Preamble. I like, I like that word. We're going to amble I like that. through the pre together. Preambles. There's a lot of talk these days about Generation Alpha. What is that? Well, there was Generation Z, and then there was Generation Alpha. Because there's no letter after Z. Right. They had they, they, Whoever designed Generation Z fucked up, and they realized they were like, oh, no. Yeah, there's no letter after Z. We have to go Z. back to the beginning. Then they realized, like, we have from A all the way through X, so this is great. Like, we can just go all the way back through the whole thing. Who's Generation A? There isn't one. It's Generation oh. Alpha. Oh. Uh, as an A. Okay. Anyway, so Generation Alpha is uh, the demographic cohort following Generation Z. Yep. And uh, by some are considered to be the most technologically integrated generation with seamless use of smartphones, tablets, and AI-driven devices like voice assistants, uh, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Alexa, and Serial, and Googie, and the other ones I'm not going to say because they'll, 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 turn on, they'll turn on my burn. I love cereal. Yeah, we can't say the actual names. Hey, cereal. Hey, cereal. Um, tell me how uh, to get to um, the bar. In some conversations, Generation Alpha has been dubbed as digital natives, which I think is kind of an um, incorrect assertion in some respects. Uh, because By they, the definition or just by... Just by the definition of digital natives, like it's not like they were born with a a plug stuck into their neck, and then they just kind of like pull it out from time to time. They they still know how to be outdoors and really like, get dirty, well, <laughs> and eat worms and stuff. Yeah, I I think so. I don't know if it's as common today as it used to be. I think Generation Beta, ooh, ooh Generation Beta will be more averse to eating worms and dirt. And in Roblox, sk- skiing their knees and jumping BMX bikes over awesome ramps, then Generation Alpha. Okay. Backwards. The term Generation Alpha, by the way, was coined by a gentleman named Mark McCrindle, who's a social researcher and demographer. Uh, and, and basically, it covers the cohort of children born in 2010. Although it starts as early in some cases, depending on who you're talking to, as 2005. So Her- Harold McCrindle, what's his name? Uh, Beatrice McCrindle, a.k.a. Mark McCrindle. Mark McCrindle. So yep. he, he, he thinks it's 2010, but we don't. We don't. He thinks it's 2010. However, some people are saying it's 2005. So Mark McCrindle, I guess, is, I don't know who this gentleman is, by the way. I'm sure he's a really nice gentleman. Um, I'm sure he is. is, yeah. is attached to the uh, the name of Generation Alpha, and he himself designated it as 2010, but some other people are saying it's 2005. Anyway. According to sources. According to sources. It's 2005. Google it. My kids, <laughs> uh, I have two of them, are both considered technically Gen Z based on this cutoff. However, both are also on the cusp of Gen Z and Gen Alpha. It should probably be considered the beta test for Gen Alpha, considering mm. that they are early 2000s kids. They were also handled, handed iPads. I'm not going to lie. Like, we were in a line or we were in a car, and the kids get on your shit. You gave an iPad. Yeah, that's right? what we do, too. And that was that was before 2005, so there it is. Um, <clears throat> that's what it is. Generation Alpha Beta 1. Beta 1. Thank you. Yeah. So Generation Alpha is supposed to go through 2025, assuming, of course, that we all make it that long. Um, and then I guess it'll be Generation Beta starting in 2026. Uh, there's a wealth of things you and I could talk about uh-huh. uh, for Generation Alpha, from yeah. global events that have occurred in their lifetime uh, to how much privacy they've relinquished without understanding what privacy even means or how much privacy their parents have relinquished on their behalf. So I wanted to get a couple of your thoughts about this concerning the likelihood of um, both of us yeah. hiring, hiring <laughs> Gen Alpha kids while yeah. we're still, I mean, you and I probably still have a good good run. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm excited about it, to be honest with you. Okay, so I, I had two, two big kind of questions for you, two big yeah. thoughts. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'll do them one at a time. 
With the advent of online learning platforms and educational apps like uh, Coursera, Khan Academy, and so on and so forth, um, alphas are likely to experience a different learning environment compared to previous generations, like like yours. Yeah, yeah. And, and even, even the Gen Z, millennials. So I have seen firsthand how schools have struggled through both of my kids' educations, and I'm sure you've seen it to a degree with your son and schools and what they're funded with, et cetera. Sure, sure. To adapt to technology changes. Mm -hmm. So how do you think it's going to change with yours? Like, how do you think, like, so, so I have a son in college and a daughter about to go to college. So I'm kind of at the other end of the spectrum, but you're not. I know. So how do you think it's going to change with um, your son? I think education is going to become a little more privatized, not as we think of private schools today. I think you'll be able to buy an app or a tool or get, you know, through the state or whatnot, an app or a tool if you need extra help with certain things and be able to actually get the education you want and need. Um, the, what makes me think about this is that Khan Academy has uh, something called Khan, Khan Migo, I think is what it's called. And that's a chat bot. It's an AI chat bot. And what it does, it's not just a, you know, ask chat GPT or ask Google for the answer or type it in your cal calculator and get the answer. It, it, it has a conversation with the child and it brings them to an answer by asking more questions to help them find the, the answer. I think what's, what's going to change a little bit is, it, and this is just me thinking out loud here, is that you'll be able to go, if you know what to look for today, there are tools that you can go use for nothing, for free to, to learn. Yeah. But they compete with Roblox and they compete with Nintendo and they compete with other things that are on the tablet. And I think that's what sometimes clouds the, the opportunity to use some of these apps um, because the other things are there as well. Um, but it's also very possible that learning experiences happen in some of those virtual worlds. I mean, that would be a really interesting concept if um, teachers or some sort of curriculum or whatnot inserted itself into Roblox somehow. Yeah. Um, you're seeing the Museum of Science has a Roblox um, sort of educational experience that you can go in and use at the, through the Museum of Science about Mars. There's things like that that I think will be a, um, even more so accessible to Generation Alpha, and they will know probably about it before their parents do. <laughs> so let me ask you. That, and I think that's exciting, actually, because they're going to bring more things for us to learn. So in terms of those learning, uh, I mean, we're going to be hiring them. Yeah. They're entering a workforce that's likely to be dominated by... AI automation. Yep. Uh, a whole new job sector we haven't thought of yet. Yes. So when you think about your son, as you think about my kids who mm -hmm. are soon to matriculate from school, like within the next five years, um, what types of skills do you think they will need to develop, such as like adaptability to, to new technologies? Yes. Uh, problem solving to new technologies, continuous learning. And then I, I would say like, when you think about this, I mean, we, we learned cursive writing. Yeah. You don't um, need that anymore. There'll be a whole bunch of things they don't need to know either. Yeah, like right? think about all the things that they don't have to know anymore. So thinking about this, um, like when you think about your, your son yeah, and yeah. my kids, like what, what comes to mind in terms of, okay, I'm going to hire this person. What, mm. what do I expect them to know? Um, I, first thing I'll say is that I expect to learn a lot from these people. <laughs> As they come in, they're going to have a, a lot of experiences I didn't get to have. So I have to keep an open mind when they come in to, to work for me. And there's a lot of new things and ideas that I may never have th thought of or even knew were possible. So that's number one. Number two is, I think, understanding the the need for you know, that things don't may, may not move as fast in a business as they do uh, you know, outside of a business. They should move as fast, and maybe that's where they can be leaders and help us move faster. Um, but I think get it as soon as you can. It just works. Um, that's some, some expectations they're going to have, and that yeah. may not be the case in a business that's 25 years old, right? Yeah. So there's sort of that adaptability is important, flexibility and being willing to learn. Um, those are all important things. Te technically, I... I I don't really have an answer. I, I think there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot that's going to change and I expect to probably learn more than, 
then be able to guide some of that. I, I hope to be able to give the the leadership and the kind of influencing and the capabilities to connect that that maybe is still <laughs> is still relevant for them as they get into their 20s. But to think about 20 years from now or even 18, maybe 15 is the new hiring age. Things are moving so fast. Yeah. And these tools are so available that, <clears throat> hey, you can take your last year of uh, school and work at the same time because everything's being done remotely. And you already have the skills to get something done that helps an organization that can give you equity in a business. And, oh, by the way, you can go learn about these other things because it's so accessible and so virtual um, that maybe we can give people more responsibility earlier in, in that scenario. But that's incredibly whew, optimistic, right? I love it, man. But I'm excited about it because I know everyone's, you know, doom, doomsdaying. And I just, I think we got to give uh, both generations, Gen Z and, and Generation Alpha, like the opportunity to innovate. Um because they don't have the barriers that they that that maybe we had with technology challenges or just even with accessibility to technology and that type of thing, um, they may have some more time to get create some ideas instead of filling out forms and <laughs> writing reports and doing other things like that. They they may be able to dream a little bit more. I know that's kind of a happy way of putting it, oh. but but I I hope that the time that is saved is used to change the world. Well, here's to eternal optimism. I'm very optimistic. Enough lollygagging. Let's get on with this. Let's this rock show. this thing. Yeah, let's do this. back to the calculus of it psyched to be back you ready for the cognitive load dump i love cognitive loads this episode has some trigger warnings okay trigger warnings so i'm telling you now i'm going to give you a few moments to to turn off your computer and shut down and go watch like something a little bit more safe maybe in, maybe like a marvel movie or something um <laughs> So, so number one, if you work for an MSP, you maybe want to skip this episode. Okay. Or Microsoft Paint. Microsoft Paint. If you work, if you are a developer in Microsoft Paint, uh, you may want to skip this episode. Also, if uh, aging white men drinking whiskey uh, and talking about IT bothers you, you may want to just leave the room or like go. Go find some other podcasts. There's like a lot of crime podcasts that are pretty cool right now. True crime. Um, also, if, if occasional burping or an overwhelming amount of cognitive load bothers you, maybe maybe go back with like options. Just go back to the Netflix. Like Seinfeld's on Netflix. Just watch Seinfeld. Yeah, I, this I like Seinfeld. You. So go on to, to Twitch TV and watch the. Yeah, yeah. yeah I forget. I'm going to say it. So, so this week's sponsor <laughs> is. Sad salads. Sad salads, my new firm. <laughs> so, I'm starting up. If you are, if you are somebody who gets salads, okay. If you get salads and they are sad, they're very sad. I mean, you look at the salad and you're just like, I don't know what's sadder, the salad. If any of my or sadness. If any of my friends are watching or ever do decide to watch. They'll be shocked that I had a salad, period. You had a salad. So every week we have this show, and before the show we have dinner, uh, Mike yeah. and I and our guests. It's very we romantic. Talk, we talk about the show and like what we're going to talk about and you know, kind of shoot the shit. And, and for the last, I think, three episodes, Mike's gotten a salad. And usually it's like a, it's like a, it's like a good salad. Like You look at the salad, you're like, okay, yeah. I'll eat that salad like yeah. with a steak or something. But tonight... Yeah. 
<laughs> like asked me to order a salad that was like I was ordering it on it toast a, and toast was like are you sad it was it was a chicken Caesar salad that's it <laughs> it was it was sad it was it was green yeah and like I, the I went to the I went to the place to pick it up and the, the guy who gave it to me gave me some, a couple extra napkins he was like in case you know, he, he was, ho- in case it's <laughs> he was really, hoping I didn't get it all over me. In case it's really sad night. Oh, yeah. He's like, you know, you got a little. I was like, you know, it's just I'm sad ordering this. I had uh, there was a little bit of cheese on it. Just a little bit. So sad salads. We understand there's yeah. a place for you. I love sad salad. Mike understands there's a place for you on this planet. I do. We need sad salads because every now and then you just you can't have a salad that's always like. Like yeah. as as Elaine Bennis would call it, a big salad. Like, you can't have that all the time. You have to have occasionally a limp, yeah, you limp just cut, greens. You kind of you use your your plastic fork and you yeah, move the leaves around your gently. Fork and, and you look for the the I'm one like, crispy part. Wow, there's a crouton. <laughs> Sad salad. And then and then it's soaked with all the the. <laughs> The whatever it is, and it's the uh, vinaigrettes. No, there was there was vinaigrettes. No, is sad dressing. It was very wet. The moisture inside. That's soaked. just that's just the the tears of your salad. It, it was so cr- it was crying. It made uh, the the salad was so sad. It it cried and made <laughs> the croutons mushy. It was so sad. Sad salads. Thank you for sponsoring our episode tonight. Um, we love you. Everyone, even watching though the door, you like, make Ugh. us. <laughs> I gotta get I gotta get a salad, so make I was it gonna sad. Eat, I was gonna eat this this pizza I made and have a beer, but ah fuck it. Now I gotta yeah. have a sad salad. You wanna no, no, hold the tomatoes, hold the croutons. Yeah. I'm gonna walk in like this. <laughs> I just want you gotta look down the whole time because like, yeah, I'll have your sad salad. <laughs> Did you say side salad? No, sad, <laughs> sad salad. salad. Nothing on the side. Yes. Give it to me, just lettuce, <laughs> croutons, and um, one crouton. Give me a drop of vinaigrette. <laughs> Do you have well, al- apple slices on the side? Nope, that's not nope. a sad salad. <laughs> no, you can't have slices. apple slices. That's against the rules. Yep. No apple slices. So sad salad. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and somehow we're gonna hook you. Sad salad. We're gonna hook you up with mayo. Because mayo Come and on. sad salad. See, that would make it really sad. In my opinion, that would no, make it really sad. No, that would make a slightly... Mike, you're the eternal optimist. We're trying to make salad, sad salad a little happier. How about some, like, peaches? Like, little peaches Okay, on peaches. We're not... That's not our sponsor yet. You oh. can't say sponsors we don't have yet. Well, I mean, it could be a sad salad with peaches or, like, like a little fruit garnish or okay, something. Okay, well, peaches, if you want to Apple. sponsor us, just reach out. Uh, Nate at... The C O I T dot U S or Mike at the T H E C O I T dot U S and we'll would gladly take you as a sponsor for Mike's Sad Salad. Just shave the apple peel. Don't give me the apple, just give me the peel. It's <laughs> all I want. Just the apple peel over dry lettuce. Just apple rinds. Apple rinds. <laughs> apple rinds, please. Um, that's where all the nutrition is. Uh, I asked uh, Conlingo about this, and it told me to eat apple peels. Okay. All right. Go All ahead. right. Well, no. Enough of no, this crap. Listen, listen we had it's a, it's important to plug the sponsors, so oh, we I had mean, to, we had to do that. Um, but this chapter is about sad salads. This chapter is about managing your managed services provider, aka your MSP. Hence the trigger warning. Um, I'm going to read a little bit. I'm actually right. going to read the chapter. All right. And then we're going to talk about it. I have a couple of questions at the end of the chapter, just to spark some conversation, Mike, because I'm a, I'm worried that this might is such a, a banal chapter. I'm going to be hiding under the desk. <laughs> I'm ready for this one. This is going to be fun. And then we have some other fun things to talk about. So, all right, all right I need the. Um... Oh, hold on, hold on. We got a toast. Yes, we do. To um, the good times. Yeah, 2024, man. Yeah, 2024. Uh, it's a Olympic year. Yes, it is. Presidential year. Yes, so many things uh, going to happen number? this year. No, not a prime number. It's uh, the other one. Is it part of the Fibonacci sequence? Yes, it's part of the Fibonacci sequence. And uh, I, I don't know math. I was a classics major, so I'm not just going to admit that right now. So I never think trust it's me an yet. even year. It's an even number. Yeah, it's an even number. It's an even number. You can divide it by two. At least. 
That's so here's awesome. the two. Hey, here's the two. Here's the two. All right. What are you drinking tonight? Uh, Quantum whiskey. No. Quantum um, whiskey. Kentucky Owl. Oh, you had that last week. Doubling up, man. This is fantastic uh, this stuff. is going oh. to shock our listeners, but I'm having Lagavulin 16 again. Lava lamp. I love that Lava stuff. Lamp. That is it. so good. Mm-hmm. Mm. Mm. That uh, is not sad. How have they managed to convert um, sheep dung into this beautiful brown liquid is a mystery that we'll never solve. So I need the uh, I need my little audible entry. This is audible. Okay, we won't get sued for that one. <laughs> okay, chapter, and I'm back to paper, by the way, so too bad. Uh, I think people. Mickey Mouse is no longer, you can use the voice now because it's... Yeah, all right, I'm down with that. Okay, you can use whatever voice you want. Chapter seven, managing your managed services provider. In rare cases, some life science companies will co-opt an internal role to manage IT in their nascency, a.k.a. someone who knows IT. As this is the exception to the rule, we will instead focus on the most likely scenario for what you will encounter on day one, a.k.a the Embedded Managed Services Provider, or MSP, as they are more commonly known. Mm. It is an excellent exercise. That's... Who wrote this shit? It is an... Me. <laughs> it is an excellent exercise. Yeah, That's for why sure. Why didn't Grammarly really catch that? It's an excellent exercise... Oh, my God. To familiarize yourself <laughs> with the MSPs in your area. I'm going to strike that sentence. I think you should keep going. No. Okay. You're a human being. You should endeavor to know the types of work they do, the technology stacks they employ, and the strengths and weaknesses of the individuals that work for the MSP, as well as the overall reputation of the MSPs themselves. This investigation could be done in many ways, but often you will find that peer reviews from your life sciences colleagues will help you piece together a pretty comprehensive dossier. One specific thing is that every MSP has a preferred technology stack that they will deploy to all of their clients. Footnote. They even use the same passwords, infrastructure schemas, workarounds, and all-around lousy judgment in some cases. Here are some actual examples from MSPs in the New England region. Vendor number one. For collaboration, again, footnote, I am still waiting for a compelling argument from anyone as to why MSPs don't deploy, or at least offer, Google Workspace to companies of this size. Vendor number one, collaboration, Office 365 and Teams, file storage, box, endpoint encryption, Sophos, endpoint backup, crash plan, data backup, Datto, email security, Mimecast, laptop, Lenovo, or a weak Mac, infrastructure, Cisco and Dell, help desk, homegrown. Vendor number two, collaboration, Office 365 and SharePoint, file storage, box, endpoint encryption, Microsoft, endpoint backup, crash plan, data backup, Zerto, email security, Mimecast, laptop, Dell, and once again, a weak ass Mac, infrastructure, Cisco, help desk, service now. Vendor three, Office 365 and Teams, file storage, Dropbox, endpoint encryption, Sophos, endpoint backup, Commvault. Data backup, Datto. Email security, Mimecast. Laptops, Lenovo's, or weak-ass Macs. Infrastructure, Cisco, and help desk, homegrown. <clears throat> Throughout your job interviews and your key stakeholder meetings, you should have developed a solid idea of the internal sentiment towards the MSP, as well as a comprehensive understanding of the gaps in their service. It falls upon you to determine how long they will stay, to what extent you will want to continue aspects of their service, and ultimately, how you will eventually part ways. In almost every case, the sooner you part ways with the MSP, the better it will be for you and the organization as the MSP's primary objective, e.g. making tons of money, runs counter towards your company's goals, e.g. becoming successful. MSPs enable technology as a service, but not as a competency. In the event that you do not have an extra head for year one in the budget, you will have to do your best to make laminate out of lemons with your MSP for the time being. This is one of those areas where metrics will help you use the MSP costs to demonstrate their value or complete lack thereof 
and expedite your partner's hiring. However, even that may take time. So take careful note of how well the MSP has done in terms of fulfilling their remit to date and then mandate changes to the MSP on a go-forward basis until such time as you can hire your partner. One of your first tasks is to understand the nature of the MSP relationship as it existed before your arrival. Likely, there are already contracts and agreements in place which carry on some future point in your tenure. It is even likely that these agreements predate your manager or anyone else with whom you have spoken. MSPs all have unique language in their contracts, which tends to ensure that they will be guaranteed revenue for a considerable length of time after a transition has begun. Further, some MSPs will renew the clock on the entirety of their services any time an amendment is made to any single existing agreement. Be very careful before you start changing any agreements that exist. It is also essential to understand that an MSP makes its money from two primary sources, labor charges and price margins on software and hardware. Despite all appearances, you can be confident there is no altruistic strategy in place. To wit, the primary goal of an MSP is to squeeze the client for as much money as possible while the clock of opportunity is still ticking. Labor charges can be costly. Often companies will be overpaying for essential services without realizing that they are doing so. Footnote. Even when realized, some companies feel powerless to stop it, which may be one of the reasons why you are now in this role. Especially when it comes to recurring preventable incidents. Further, MSPs will buy bulk software licensing to receive a discount for themselves and then provide an adequate number of licensed seats to the company while still charging them at the original retail rate, often including a substantial surcharge for installation and upkeep. This latter example occurs far too often and makes it quite difficult for the business to transition licenses under their name seamlessly. Transitioning licenses, ironically, cost the company even more money as MSPs will enact a labor charge for the work required to transition the licenses away. Footnote. Did you know it can take two hours to write a single email asking for a license transfer? True (laughs) fact. So, to conduct the most comprehensive review process of your MSP, there are a few critical steps you will want to take right away. Have them provide all the service and support measures going back as far as possible. Do they even have them? What do they look like? And did it take a while to provide them? E.g., do they have to manufacture them out of thin air? Are they even close to what you would consider reasonable? Are they charging the business for egregious amounts for straightforward tasks? Are there recurring issues that they use as an assured revenue source for labor service hours? Do they charge you for maintenance tasks that are unnecessary? What is their balance between reactive and proactive? Is there any proactivity at all? Have they ever used any type of change control in the environment? Can they provide those change controls? Then, have them provide copies of all service agreements and contracts. What do they guarantee? How far out do they make their company sign the agreement to maintain their services? Is the company responsible for paying the full hour of service call, even if the incident only takes five minutes? What is the guaranteed minimum labor rate? And were there any handshake deals made, as is often the case? Next, Have them provide full diagrams of the infrastructure and network and data map. A. Do they even exist? When you do get them, do they look like they were just thrown together at the last minute? Do they have any redundancies in place for the business? Are you using shared infrastructure with other clients? Have there been any incidents related to infrastructure at all? And what are the current firmware and patch levels of the environment? Next, have them provide any other relevant data such as a listing of all administrative accounts and passwords, a listing of all software and hardware license agreements and contracts. Ensure that you get all administrative accounts, and in as much as possible, change all the passwords immediately. You will find that MSPs do not hand over all the requisite accounts at the first request, and it will take you some time to uncover all the locations where these exist entirely. Try to determine whether you are taking part in a broader licensing scheme or where your licensing stands alone. Immediately begin transitioning all licensing internally to yourself or a service account or an independent third-party value-added reseller whom you trust. 
If there are any lease programs in place, determine the remaining value of the equipment and align that with your desire to remain on the leasing program or transition to an owned laptop program. As is the case too often, the MSP is subleasing the business equipment, which guarantees them an additional return on the laptop lease program they already started. And lastly, arrange to meet with the owner of the MSP face-to-face. This meeting will provide you with several key pieces of information, such as how well does the owner know your business? What is their stake in the success of the business? Do they have any long-term plans for the business? Do they merely put together a transition plan for the new IT lead? And are they merely hoping you will let them stay? Additionally, you will want them to use this meeting to frame out with the owner how you will be transitioning away from them. Note that the owner knows this is coming, so expect some difficulties when you engage them in the discussion on a transition plan, but it must be clear to them there will be a transition plan. A good litmus test to see what type of MSP you're dealing with is as follows. Do they hand you a sensible transition plan on day one, fully prepared to make you successful? In that case, the MSP might be worth keeping around, at least for some smaller tasks, especially if there is no budget for the second hire in IT. Work on a new contract with the MSP and agree on a transition plan. Or, do they have nothing prepared to hand you on your first day except tickets to a game? In that case, dissolve the partnership <laughs> as fast as possible. Continue to move forward with it. Continue to move forward will result in a toxic outcome. Overall, having all this information about the MSP gives you a strong sense of their brand. It lets you determine how important they are towards helping you meet the business and IT needs. The information will also reveal how much longer they need to be kept as a partner resource. You may find that they are abysmal in terms of support service, but have a guaranteed full year of labor minimum remaining on their contract, which you will have to pay out if you get rid of them. Do you attempt to resolve their service issue with them or just pay out the balance? You can start answering these questions as you begin to peel back the layers of this onion. Alternatively, you may find they are quite strong in terms of service, but need some significant course correction in their on-site staff behavior. Whatever the case may be, you need to have a bona fide plan for determining how long they will stay, what you will use them for, how you will adjust their behaviors to suit your demands, and how you will transition them out. So what will you use them for? Regardless of the contract language, there will be a minimum time for which you will need to keep the MSP around and utilize them for some specific tasks. There's no way to get around that. Let's break down some of the possibilities. A, no matter what, you will need to do the following actions with the MSP, and this could take several weeks. Maintain essential support services while making whatever changes are necessary to improve the overall support situation, whether that is a change in staff or hours on site. Transfer all licenses to yourself or an internal service account. Clean up any directories and platforms for rogue or unnecessary accounts. Understand how all software currently impacts the business including forming an understanding of who uses it. Transition all administrative accounts to yourself or an internal service account and change the passwords. Make any necessary infrastructure control transitions and document infrastructure architecture. Additionally, B, you may have to keep using them as they are in the middle of implementing a new platform or infrastructure. Utilize them as labor on a new project while you await the hire of your new partner. Utilize them or a new MSP to maintain a decent service level if no heads are budgeted for year one. Have them be an additional pair of hands for an ongoing outage or significant issue. Utilize them as labor to support a physical move of the business. Or have them document their processes to date on specific tasks such as the lab machine management or how long they have been utilizing a particular platform. There may be other actions that occur during this period. Still, As you have already hopefully laid out in your transition plan, you will want to avoid starting any new initiatives with the MSP. Even if they have been a dependable business partner and the business is generally happy with their service and you intend to continue with an MSP into the future, it behooves you to review the MSP market as a whole and determine if there is possibly a better fit for your organization out there. This will not only put the incumbent MSP on notice and potentially allow you to negotiate better terms, but it will also allow you to potentially find a better partner who can provide even more services depending on what business needs in year one. One other important note is that, in some cases, the technicians you have on-site from the MSP are actually innocent. 
and unaware of the more significant problems surrounding them. They are merely working under the mandate of their role to come on site as needed and solve your issues and not ask questions. It may even be the technician is quite good, but they happen to pick an employer who overshadows their accomplishments with shitty management. There is, unfortunately, little you can do except to part ways on a positive note with the technician. Be careful, though, because if you think that you will hire that technician away someday from the MSP, it is a 100% guarantee that the MSP has put enough language in place to ensure that you cannot poach their staff without a significant compensatory response. So how will you part ways? Well, with your list of transition tasks agreed upon, you will want to establish a relationship and date. Provide this information to the MSP owner as soon as you feel sure you will be able to adhere to it. Be sure to have them sign it. A handshake will not suffice. Do not try and do this via a handshake or verbal agreement. Only written and signed documents will do. Do not provide a transition plan that is too aggressive, as you may find yourself suddenly unable to hire your IT partner and stuck with juggling too many roles for some time. Do not be too passive with your transition plan. Or you may find that you have this anchor around your neck and what feels like never-ending invoices for services you no longer need. Do strike a comfortable medium that is aggressive enough to get the transition task done and allow you some cushion in bringing your IT partner and getting them fully on board. The transition itself need not be ceremonial. It should be clear to all that there will be a final invoice on a final date and then after that there will be no more services required. Both sides should have agreeably transitioned all tasks. This is something that you will want to document in your transition agreement. With any luck, the MSP and the business will part ways amicably, though this is rare. Remember that even if the business demands you exercise the MSP or find their services are deplorable, you still need to plan what happens after the day that they are gone. Mm -hmm. At the very least, your new service model needs to be an improvement over what the MSP offered across the entire spectrum of services. Don't dump the MSP and then continue to provide the same level or worse of service that existed before. Take advantage of the opportunity to make a demonstrable improvement to the business. It will reflect directly on you. And when the people are happy because of the excellent services, you will have a springboard for so many of your other initiatives yet to come. Key takeaways from Chapter 7. Assess your MSP immediately when you begin your new role and develop a concrete action plan to remove or replace. Focus on your transition tasks from the MSP, such as software license turnover, password changes, and infrastructure controls. If you have to keep an MSP due to no additional headcount being budgeted for, find one that most closely aligns with your needs and establishes contractual terms that guarantee a seamless transition when you are finished with them at a later date. And lastly, Do not start any new projects with your current MSP if it can be avoided. Instead, focus on transitioning the MSP out of projects and services while you, and possibly your partner, or another vendor rotates in to complete the efforts. Pro tips, make sure you read the fine print when it comes to purchasing or signing anything with your MSP. Too often, there will be vague or hidden language that guarantees them a lock-in for time, fees, or both. Your legal head, if you have one, should thoroughly review any contracts which need to be signed if one exists. You need to read every single document because they may have blanket clauses in the original MSA that transfer to any subsequent amendment. This happens far too often. Your MSP agreements are almost certainly one-sided when it comes to penalties for non-adherence. That is to say, you are the only one accountable. It is your right to rewrite the agreements to provide two-way accountability for the agreement term's balance. Any MSP who balks at this notion is not a future partner. Be sure to demand all the possible metrics that you feel entitled to. This is especially important as it relates to the help desk and support incidents. You can probably piece together a general idea of what is happening from the support side by interviewing key stakeholders. Still, If you genuinely want to understand the nature of the environment, there is no better information source than a deep dive into support data, again, if it exists. And when reviewing help desk metrics, take a few extra minutes and compare them to the actual invoices to ensure that they match up. 
in terms of life science hacks, every venture capital company that funds life sciences companies has a preferred MSP, which they deploy to their seed round and Series A backed companies. The fact that the MSP may be inherently corrupt or provide abysmal services is secondary to the immediate goal of getting essential IT services running at their investment. Dig deep into the license agreements, especially when it comes to localized fat client software that is scientifically focused. You will find unused licenses that you're paying for and licenses for employees long since terminated. Scientific software is expensive. And then lastly, MSPs use the same passwords from customer to customer, Ugh. or at least the same patterns from customer to customer. I hope Sh- not. They do. Oh, that's horrible. Change them immediately because <laughs> it won't be too difficult for bad actors to guess. Further, as it is extremely easy to social engineer an MSP help desk, ask them to demonstrate how they verify their end users who are who they say they are. And lastly, <laughs> things to watch out for. The first time I walked into a life sciences company as a new IT leader, I actually tried to make the MSP partnership work. I had enough of an ego to think that, despite all the shoddy work done to date, and despite all the customer feedback that they had to go, that I could turn the ship around. Well, I failed. And I created additional enmity between myself and the MSP, and between the MSP and my customers. In all that time, I was trying to make things better, I should have worked on a transition plan. As a result, it took me almost 10 months to remove the MSP. And I still ended up paying about $300,000 wow. in transition fees. Even after you've shown them the exit, you will still find a multitude of places where their presence still exists and beguiles you for months. This is called the MSP virus. You will find accounts that they did not tell you about, for which they they only have the password. You will discover substantial security holes, especially with file sharing. And you will find things that you cannot change, such as forgotten licensing agreements without their help. Do not think for a second that, after they transition out, that you are free and clear. Every single time I've walked into an MSP situation, I have dreaded the period post-MSP. And I can recall one situation in which an MSP renewed a three-year contract every single time. Their client added more video conferencing licenses, but to not tell the client. The MSP would literally start the three-year contract over again, even if the client added one more seat. Doesn't that have to be signed? Doesn't the MSA have to be signed? How in the world can they do that? It's wild. Yeah. Um, is it illegal? It's legal if, if it's approved. Oh, I see. So it's not coming to you. Or it wasn't before. <clears throat> well, think about... So so that concludes the chapter, but oh, there's sorry, a few... Follow- no, no, no. Yeah. So think about um, if you use a, a, a PO slash invoicing solution. Yep. And your AP department gets an invoice. Mm-hmm. Okay. And uh, legal... So legal won't see that. That's right. And at the at the end of the invoice on page two is a statement which declares that upon signing an agreement of the invoice and remit of the payment, the contract will start over. Wow. Exactly. I've never seen that's wild. Yep. So well, it's kinda like if you pay us, you're renewing your contract, that type of thing? By adding more seats to this agreement, you are renewing the term oh, of your agreement. Technically, you would need to up a PO or something to do that, right? You would need some way of... It doesn't you, matter. Yeah. The, but, there, I mean, there, you'd have there, some there visibility. There are two MSPs in the New England area that are notable and yep. quite large, have a lot of number, large number of clients, yep. whereby any time that you make any change whatsoever, they don't actually have to amend their MSA or SAL. They simply have to send you a new invoice, which triggers the update in the SAL vis-a-vis the MSA to immediately start the term of three years over again. So you got to watch out for that. Yes. Absolutely. So um, there were some follow-up questions to the chapter, and I'm going to throw these out there. That's very shady. You should just cut that off right away. You learn If you learn that's happening, psh, that should be the end of it, in my opinion. Well, that's, that, that's that's, but that goes to my point about the, like, when awful. you walk in there, you uh, day one, day two, 
hey, MSP, you know, nice to meet you. Give me every single document that you have with yeah. my company. Yep, absolutely. Yep. And don't even ask legal. Ask the MSP to give it to you, then ask legal, and then compare them. Yep. Who's telling the truth? And when you sift through these documents, if it's one of these vendors, yep. you're going to find language in there that says every single time an amendment is made, to any licensing agreement that we hold with, the, with you, with the client, yep. we're going to start the timer over yep. on your agreement. It's, no. It looks like pretty ambiguous language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's absolutely. actually anything. Yeah. You had one 365 seat, boom, start over. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely something. Great advice to, to look at that because I, I think most people probably assume that, like you said, no verbal anything, right? Most people probably assume that, hey, I got a partner here that I'm working with. Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> I, that's not a partner, man. If that's if that's the type of shit that gets pulled, I'm sorry. That's that's awful. So yeah, I've, point taken. There, there are point taken. <laughs> My gosh, that's there horrible. are MSPs, and I, I'm going to mention one, actually, if you don't mind. I don't care. Go ahead, whatever you want. I'm going to mention Nens. Um, when I walked into Affinivax, Nens was there. Yeah. And Nens works with a lot of flagship new companies. Yeah. And I gave them pretty much right away, you know, the, um, thank you very much. Uh, I'm taking over, um, you know, let's transition everything over to me. Sure. Yeah. They did. And, and they, their technicians that they, that I, ca I had to keep them on site because we had some projects coming up. We had some laptop things I had to change. Sure. Yeah. Some software. Yep. They kept working, and we parted ways amicably. Yeah. And um, I, th there was, they were on a year by year basis with sure. the contract. Yeah. And so we were coming up with there was, there was like five months left or four months left. So I used the bulk of that. I think there was one month left at the end that I didn't really need them on site, but I paid out the balance and that was fine. And it was, it was amicable. Um, that's a rarity. And I was pleasantly surprised to see this happen yeah. and, and not get, you know, all that other, you know, and I, I, nasty grams. I'll, yeah. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a bit of a, a bit of a prima donna. I know this is going to shock everybody who <gasps> I know when it comes to how I want it to run in a company, you're very passionate about it. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. Yep. And, uh, it. They dealt with my bullshit. So, so, and, and that, that alone to me, again, makes me think like it was, they, they were doing it right. But, but this is goes to one of the questions I have, sure. which is, so let me frame this for you in context and then you can tell me what you think. All right. Sure. So, so no MSP starts by saying, oh, we're going to just fuck all these companies over and make a ton <laughs> of cash. Right. They start by, <laughs> by saying, Hey, listen, like, I can I can support a company and do IT. I yeah. need a couple of my a couple of my buddies and we can do IT better than anybody else. So like we'll charge them a couple a couple thousand dollars, whatever. Yeah, sure. And then they then they're good at it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they get a second client. And they're like, okay, well we can do two clients, no problem. Then they get ten. And they're like, oh, we probably should hire some people. Yeah. And get like uh something that we can we can better support. Then yep. they get fifty. Yep. And now they're like, well shit. Now we got to make a company out of this, and now we got to like have standards, and we got to hire some people, and we got to have like be a company company. Mm -hmm. Then they got a hundred, yeah, and at some point between like five and a hundred, it stops being, it stops being a uh, yeah. We could yeah. really make this an awesome company to a let's just keep churning. We just got to yeah. keep buying seats and make margins, and we got to, you know. I think that speaks to a lot of why they choose the vendors they choose and, you know, the, the deals they make with software vendors. And they've got to figure out ways to scale. But the bigger you get, if you're not automating, you're not reinvesting in the operational side of that of your business, just like if us. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. if you can automate a lot of these processes that a, a standard MSP does, and we both know there are tools and, and services, if you're willing to try them, some are not um, to, to implement them. Um, you may not need an MSP very much, except for the things that, like you said, an extra pair of hands every now and then, if you can negotiate that. But, yeah. I mean, it's just, um, you, 
the the uh, bring your own device model and bring your own computer type thing emerging, getting easier to implement in a secure way. Like what what basic tenets of service do they does a, a standard MSP need to provide in the next decade? You know, that's not specialty. If 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 they have some that comes in, yeah. even even as a team of one, that can automate a lot of these, whether it's onboarding process or or offboarding or you know standard cybersecurity processes. I mean, it. I mean, based on you know just digesting some of what you read, so, some of the in order to scale, like you said, a five person. You know, maybe I'm a I'm a bunch of buddies starting an MSP and I need to scale. The biggest challenge is cybersecurity and standards. You mentioned standards, right? And one of the reasons why MSPs use shared accounts and shared passwords is because they're pooling up resources for you. And they all need one account instead of 50, or they think they do. And that creates a massive security risk. Totally. They're also very easy to social engineer if they're not verifying who's calling is, who's calling in. And they have no mechanism. On the flip side, now that you're you're there, uh, you know, or I'm there, or you're there, Nate, uh, you know, as a as a head of IT, they need to be told what good looks like or what you expect. You need to have a run book. You need to have a, you need to set expectations about what you need to have in place because that's why you've been hired, and they should be able to sort of follow that that. Um, Sort of, sort of rule book, if you will, and managing the change management that will come with that because it's gonna, it's gonna change things. Um, it, and I think the bad MSPs may look at that and go, oh, we're gonna charge you more now because we're gonna. It's harder for us to work that way. Well, you shouldn't be working that way at all. Yeah. And you should. I mean, if there, are, I mean, even password policy. I, I go back to that because when you said that, that really struck a chord. It's like, that's one oh one stuff. You don't have you know, six character password that everyone's sharing. You know, like for for keys to the kingdom. I, mean, I just that just blows my mind that in twenty twenty three that's still happening. That's across a scale, so- that's a scale problem though. So if I have a hundred and fifty clients yeah. as a company, I need I need to develop patterns. Like patterns but have to happen. You need people within those MSPs who understand privilege access management or investing in tools that can scale Instead of keep using the tools they had, I'm talking from their operational business. Sure, sure. Uh, keep using the tools they had that worked with five people. Right. But they they want the larger margin, so they don't reinvest, and they're building stuff on, on not scale. When their service level goes down, and everything hurts from that respect. Yeah. There are some MSPs that um, that I know of, and not I don't think I've worked with either of these, but um, they haven't innovated anything in like a decade. They haven't no. changed anything of how they work, and they don't need to though. Or they like this one that doesn't even believe in the cloud. I mean, it's like, yeah. how, how are you still operating and well, not I, losing I, money? I walked into Exilio, my current employer, and wasn't shocked at all to see two racks, top to bottom, full. Yeah, of servers, hardware, APCs. Um, 10 switches for, 10 com- switches for a company of 105. Wow. 10, 24, and 48 port switches. Um, more, basically, enough infrastructure to run a company of 300. Uh huh. Uh huh. In a closet. And I, I scratched my head saying, like, somebody, somewhere along the line, someone's saying, oh, we need this. You told us that we need this. Okay, I'll sign that. Yeah. So yeah. go ahead, go ahead and put that in there, and then it's bought. It's not used. Um, so so Kate and I decommissioned ninety percent of that data center. Kate's my number one. Uh, and we just shut it all down, unplugged it, took it off, deracked it, put it all behind the the, the racks on the floor. The company's running fine. Yep. Nobody noticed the change, and we now have we're now using ten percent of our port density. Yep, um, because it was never needed to be bought in the first place. Yeah, uh, and that's that's just somebody got the wool pulled over their eyes, and and they were charged a premium for hardware that was bought either through a refurb program or through like a Dell discount program mm-hmm. or any one of those other number of partnerships with the margins. So do you know that. 
If I if I'm an MSP, yeah, and I sell you box licenses, yeah, I make twenty four percent on every seat. Wow. And I'm not even going to tell you what a night seats are, yeah. but there's a margin, yeah, per seat. All I got to do is get you to sign for it. Yeah, that's that's a st Microsoft developed and, that, right? Microsoft that, that, has the, the Microsoft same, partnership program. Well, Microsoft same thing. Microsoft isn't that great unless you're at like big volume. Yeah. But this is the point. Like, if I have 150 clients and I have one Microsoft agreement and I'm buying all these seats and I'm apportioning them out as a var, yeah, I mean the margins. Who gives a shit? There's a, there's a classic burp. Who gives a Ooh. shit, by the way, if the clients are happy or not? I'm making my margins on, on licensing and hardware. I'm buying yeah. I'm buying Dell's $1,100 each, selling them for $1,400 each back to the client. Yep. That's business, man. Yeah. <laughs> Buy low, That's, sell high. Not, not surprised. That's why you go to the Apple store. So I, I have a couple follow-up questions. <laughs> I'm going to throw these you know, out there. Right. And, and, and Yeah, yeah. And, I'm going to ask these questions. Happy to answer whatever I Any can. one of these, stop and just answer it. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Give me one. <laughs> what criteria <clears throat> should a company use when selecting an MSP for partnership? How should a company weigh the MSP's experience in the life sciences sector during the selection process? Depends. I think that one's tough because it depends on where the organization is and yeah. what you want, what role you want them to play. And what your budget is. But, uh, yeah, go ahead. Go to the next one. Um, in terms of service level agreements, what key elements should be included in, in an SLA with an MSP to ensure accountability and quality of service? Mm -hmm. And then further to that, how can SLAs be structured to incentivize the MSP? And I can answer that one if you don't have any. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So if I have, let's say I have, I have X tickets per month uh, that come in from my users. The first question I'm going to ask, and this is me being me, is why do I have tickets in the first place? Uh -huh. Like, why do they exist? Why are they ask, even asking questions? Yeah. Now, suppose that they're asking questions because something is straight up broken. Mm -hmm. Well, I my service level agreement actually doesn't apply here. I'm gonna, I want the MSP to fix the thing that's broken, or I'm going to sure. fix it. Sure. But if, in fact, that thing can't be fixed, it's just an issue of user error, right? They haven't been trained yet, or something else. My expectation is a very, very small window. Like my SLA shrinks down to when a user asks a question, within 30 minutes they have a solution. Not four hours, not eight hours. Like I'm going to go after what I think is an acceptable minimum. Yeah. And that's not a first-time response either. That's re resolution. And, well, let's be honest, that's freaking impossible nearly <laughs> for an MSP to address. Yeah. I'm not being unrealistic. Yeah. I'm being unrealistic with an MSP. Yeah. If I had an FTE, 30 minutes would be too long. Yeah. But that's my response to that. So I would structure an, M an SLA to say, okay, everything that I consider to be routine should be sub 30 minutes. Everything that's slightly more complicated than routine, say one to four hours. But even then, I'm going to be splitting hairs on my definition, not yours. Yeah. But nothing exceeds four hours. Doesn't sure. matter. Sure, sure. I think. Do you think that over time, as you know, as as we hire more and more people, who, I mean, they know the standard tool sets. They know the traditional IT commodity they tools. Don't. You're, st you're still finding that. Uh, no, I'm saying. Do you think that will change? Because, I mean, there's a lot. I mean, I'm just thinking from my experience in my last couple companies is. A lot more people fix stuff on their own than I ever expected. I totally give you that. And that's that's actually a big deal these days. And I I, I embrace that fact. Yeah. I embrace that empowerment. You have to give them, of course, the room to do that. If you yeah, yeah. if you don't let them be a local administrator, then they're not fixing anything. But it's also like the emergence of Slack and like shared totally. question answer. People will be able to see. Like we had uh, Slack at Akibia for a long time. And we had a you know an IT channel. And... It was a good day when someone wrote something and someone from IT fixed someone not from IT answered yeah. and fixed the problem. Oh, I love That's that. That's great to see. Like you know? uh, our V our VP of immunology at Exilio uh, often beats us. And we're like That's awesome. That's we're, a not, great we're, thing. we're not talking like like Kate and I are ten minutes late. We're like yeah. two minutes late. 
Because he's like, as soon as it comes up, he's immediately responding, or somebody else will respond. Yeah. And and we love that that sort of like citizen support. Exactly, and that be might be a really good way to. Uh, did I say sappy? Oh, Patriots. All right. Anyway, that might be, that might be a good. Uh, you were talking about rewards. Yeah. Like it would be awesome to have a channel and be like, okay, whoever answers the most, you know, anyone at X Y Z company at my company that answers the most questions, every month there's X Y Z in it for you. Whoever answers the most IT tickets in the Slack channel or in the Teams channel or whatever you're using, um, you know, you, you get a X, Y, Z. Well, now, now I know it can backfire. It's like, well, you can't do this. Just go build a SharePoint site. No, 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 no. no, no don't tell people to do that. I'm um, not, not going to ding that. I, I, I have a ding for that, though. Hold on, hold on. It's a new ding. Oh, hold on. What the hell? That's not the ding. Oh, is, there, is there a new sound? Oh, I like that. That's a new sound. I like that's, that. Uh, that's that's a, much better than that's the a, horn. That's the plug for SharePoint. Oh, that was a plug for SharePoint. Yeah, that's the plug sound. Uh, Here, I'll play that again. That's okay. the plug for SharePoint. Okay. That's cool. I, I like these. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. I like that. I'm only going to play the other, the, the cool plug for cool com- for cool things. Uh, but I, <laughs> I, get, I, get, I get what you're saying. Like, But but here's the problem, though. I know. The, that's that's ga- Gamifying support is i might say it's the holy grail but it is up there in terms of you can achieve a a gamification model that works for citizen support to support issues i love citizen support then you've solved the big problem because there's two parts of this one is getting them of course to do it two is getting them to give the right answer yeah and uh that second part is uh it's a little tricky like oh no no you got to go ahead and like Command A and then delete. No, no, no! Don't, don't, don't. Del do tree, del tree. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Don't do that. <laughs> um, next question was: uh, What performance indicators should be tracked to assess the effectiveness of an MSP? Mm. And this goes beyond. I mean, you're going to have your key stakeholder yeah. interviews, where everyone's going to say, either, uh, yeah, I don't care, they're yeah. all right, or. Nope, they freaking suck. Get them yeah. out of here. Or you'll have like the occasional outlier who's like, actually, I had an issue and they fixed it right away, person. I think a good place to start if you're in a small company is onboarding. What's there? If you already, if you have one that's already established. It's how, almost like I told you to say that, even though I didn't. What do you mean? Is that I, what you're going to say? Yeah. Yeah, because that's a process they have to follow that's very visible, right? And what do they do? How do they manage it? How is it documented? Dude. What's everyone's experience with it? Onboarding is like the make or break moment. It's a good first impression type for thing. MSPs. Yeah. Um, so when I talk to my key stakeholders, and you should too, if you're new to this, ask them. So have you hired anyone this year? You did. How was their experience starting? How did it go? Well, actually, they didn't get their laptop for four weeks. Really. <laughs> And the, the only thing is with new employees, a lot of times they'll be like, because they're new, they'll be like, oh, it's the f- most wonderful thing ever. And then no. be, you, I, I have a few, I've had a few of those like in just past lives where it's like, are you sure? Because I'm not, I don't think you got your laptop on well, time. Well, it could be that they're sure because the prior company was even worse than that. Yeah, I guess that's possible, right? <laughs> but I'll, I'll ask, I'll ask Keith Stakeholder interviews, have you hired anybody? Oh, yeah, what was their experience like? And I'm going to talk to them and I'll go find out from that person. Yeah. Well, actually, I was here on day one. I didn't have the laptop for three days. Or I wasn't able to log anything for a week. Or I wasn't able to get XYZ platform installed. And I just scratched my head like, I get it, right? The MSP can't give everyone local administrative access. It's chaos. That's right. Unless you control it, in which case it's not chaos. So I always ask the question, like, you put all these damn controls in. And and you're doing it to generate revenue. Like, if you don't let any employee install anything, and every time they want to install something, that's a ticket. They got to call you, and you can charge more. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. And now, it's like a no. It's like if you're like if you're going to make money. And that's why they're buying the old crappy Macs. Yeah. Exactly. I you know that always blows my and I know I'm an Apple fanboy and you can pick on me all you want. No, there's no Macs on but, this table at but, all. But my my point is they don't cost anything to support and I I hear that from peers like oh I hate these I'm like I don't I don't know anyone yeah all right they don't work great with Intune I get it fact of the matter is is that 
in my my career, the people who have had Max, I never hear from them at all, ever, for, for anything. They fix their own problems. They like their machines. Even when their freaking machine end of life, I don't hear from them. Yeah. And I have to go and say, you need a new Mac now. You have to get one. It doesn't support the latest Mac OS. I got it. Yeah, you're probably one of those. You probably have a 25-year-old Mac over there. You I do. Using. You want me to show it to you? I, I believe you. I, but that's my point. It's like total cost of ownership. And the, I know we'll talk about Google or something else later, but it's the same thing. Like the stuff that doesn't cost a you lot to support. You talk about Google later. I'm just saying that the stuff that doesn't cost a lot to support that may not have all the bells and whistles in the world, and I, can't, I don't think that's true about the Mac, um, it just this it's not it doesn't just work, but it's and it's not quite set it and forget it, but some of the platforms that are out there to manage these things like you kind of like I got all these problems over here and Microsoft just pushed sixty five updates out and da 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 oh I have my new Edge AI search engine now I gotta figure out and I just got Copilot automatically Did you installed say my Edge AI search engine Mike oh a, Edge is, Edge AI, AI browser is that a is that a um flash forward to what's coming in this podcast it's an amazing release i can't wait to talk about it okay so so <laughs> hold on a second let's uh i brought us off i always do that that's no my no fault. it's okay you can bring it. mike anytime you want to just set off man no, i know i go. know man but we're gonna we gotta we got a, 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 a thing to follow here we got a plan i'm not we're not following anything we're just literally completely a muck i love uh, being a muck so so you mentioned the max um Here's a que- like here's a general philosophical question, and we're not neither of us run an MSP, no. so let's pretend that we do. And I say to you, Mike, your MSP is fucking awesome. I mean, you don't make any money, but mm-hmm. your reputation is stellar because your people never have problems. Your companies, man, they just like they run perfectly. Yeah, they never have issues. Um. And then you look at me and you say, "Well, We're Nate, broke. Nate, you, <laughs> Nate, you're like you just got your third house, and you got this flashy new Lamborghini, and um, it's red, by the mm. way, and um, I like red. It's a red one. And High insurance. You have you have all these clients that freaking hate you, and you're reviled on social media and among the IT um, glitterati." Is that, is that what it's called? But sure. But like, how do you do it, Nate? And I, and and I look back at you and I say, Mike, how do you do it? And so between us, there's a disconnect because you're actually concerned about being reputationally uh, sound. I could give a fuck about reputation. I just want to make a ton of cash. Uh huh. Where is the MSP between us that actually is the best model? Like, how does an MSP exist yeah. between our our demands? I think I think the scale thing is a reason why you still want to make obviously you still need to make money, but you can't have all these great things that make life and user experience and everything else better because you've got a bunch of clients and you've only got so many people to support them all, right? Yeah. So you're going to have to cut some corners. I think that it's similar to what you said. You've got to find the MSP that fits into your strategy. It, it's really, it's not simple, but you, you need to understand what gaps do you have or that you're trying to fill. Is it simply having continuity and redundancy for the systems you already have? Is it that you want to have new capabilities and want to be able to scale quickly? Some companies don't want to do that yet. They, they're not there yet. Maybe that's two years or three years away. You don't have to do that right away. Um, there are others where it's like, I, I need someone to come in and keep the lights on while I figure out the cybersecurity and data and data management strategy of the company. Some are, hey, I need a couple set of hands. So having MSPs that have multiple capabilities that are willing to be flexible uh, is, is really important. One thing we haven't talked about with MSPs, uh, I think that that you know, to that to that business strategy component is, can they support business applications, line of func- line applications? I mean, like. Can they support Viva? No, <laughs> or Oracle, or you know, systems that. Wait, which company? Uh, I said uh, I said Viva and Oracle. Uh, uh, yeah, mm, 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 I love it. I love it. 
um, or lab systems or benchling. Um, <laughs> he likes benchling. Okay, good. Um, I'm so glad I have control over this shit now. It's like, so great. I, I mean, love I it. I need like a soundboard. You need though. a soundboard, yeah. Um, where they're not just managing Microsoft Office 365 and Lenovo's. And you know what I mean? Like, if you've got someone who's got the multi-level tier one, tier two, tier three support that you can grow with, there's some value in, in bringing an MSP at the right time that fits with a business strategy. Well, I mean, I'll tell you this. And they do exist. I, I They they are there. I'm sure they do. They're, I they're, mean, they're, they're successful. There are lower tier MSPs, 25, 50 clients. Yeah. That are trying to make a name for themselves that won't uh, rake you over the coals on costs. They do exist today in New England. Yeah. But there are also There are some that have contract, like level three techs right out of the gate. There's too. also contract guns for hire. Yeah. It's like awesome. I can, I can call tech systems and get somebody at my company tomorrow who knows how to do three things. Yeah. Talk chew bubble gum and walk at the same time and that's the person i need to do a task right i can yep. do that so so when weighing an msp like an msp is something that you would think about at scale like there's a yeah. bigger thing right? yes um so all right i, I don't want to and having the right i mean to give them the right architecture that they can support underneath and, and, and a, in a way that it works for everybody in the yes. company I spoke to an MSP at one point in time, and this goes back now a decade nearly. Yeah. And I said, well, actually, we need some help. Um, we, were, we were cutting over another acquisition to Google from Microsoft, this company I was working at. And I said, well, do you have Google Workspace experience? Yeah. Uh, no, but we have somebody we can work with to do that. I said, well, you're, you're a big MSP. I mean, you have a hundred plus clients. How much experience do they need? You really? do not have a single person in your staff that knows Google Workspace. I mean, you all use Gmail, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. Like it's just one extra level. But no, they're going to put their resources into the bucket that's got the most likely chance for a revenue return. I I will also say that you need the resources to support Microsoft. Yes. They could probably have one or two resources to support 30 Google companies, and they need 40 people to support 40 there's, Microsoft companies. There's nothing better. Like basically, <laughs> I, they, don't need the, they don't need the resources, I don't think. There's nothing better than an MSP coming upon a company that says, we want to use SharePoint. Oh, yeah. That Huge is money. literally like, that's like, that's like a fire truck running, like driving down the street and finding a house on fire and having unlimited water. Yeah. You're just going to rake in so much cash yep. from the SharePoint team's problem-generating machine. And then they'll get Google. They're like, well, fuck. Uh, maybe I make like $100 a month. What they could do, if they being dishonest, is they could just say, I'm going to charge you the same amount to run on Google. We'll give you a much better service. We'll just charge you the same amount, and we'll have one person support it. Yeah, well. <laughs> Let's start a business. Go. Yeah. So, George yeah. LLC, Inc. Yeah. Dot like, com. It costs more to support Google. We're going to need a few extra people we here. We need a few extra people. Yeah, it's going to be like probably a hundred grand to support six seats. If you know how to use Gmail, we're now hiring for Gmail. Experts. Digital yeah. uh, experts. GDEs. Yeah, if send you, your resumes to Mike at the coit dot us. It'd be great if you know how to send an email. Uh, if you know how to add a label to an if email. If you know how to send an email, we're pretty much going to immediately make you a director. Oh, and can add stuff to spam. Oh, add stuff. To, yeah. Yes, uh, that's senior director actually. Senior director. Yeah, of, we'll need to do that of Gmail. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so I got two more questions. Let's keep it going. Here we go. I'm going to spin the wheel. Lightning round. Here we go. Lightning round. What should be included in an, in an exit plan when the time comes to kick your MSP to the... Oh, sorry. To transition away from the MSP. <laughs> um, well, I, I'm thinking very tactically here, and it's accounts. Okay. I need everything. I need to know what... And, and like you said, you're not going to get them all. Um. 
I actually that was, that's a joke, really. I mean, to some extent, you need to get those. But it's not a joke; it's the truth. It's the truth. But I mean, more importantly, I think you need a, a, a transition plan where you can have. There's going to be a little bit of time afterwards where you may need to engage with them. We we we're we uh, or dump, do you just you like to drop the gate? At, down? at my current company, we got rid of our MSP over a year ago. Yeah, and we still find what we call the MSP virus. Working in places, <laughs> and, and it just shows up. It's like, yeah. it's like, where did that come from? And we find it, we find iterations of it still in the in the world, despite everything, all, everything we've done to remove it. If you have a, if you have, if you're if you're with a really small company, depending on when you're coming in, you just forklift over to other systems. It, we, again, we did this. Just like you know, it's that, just, it's just that just other stuff. That stuff still there. So so did, if you just assume. That you were going to find little tiny, like treasures, little tiny piles of poop around the building for 12 more months. What other things do you have in place for, an, for a successful exit strategy? A new um, cybersecurity uh, EDR platform. That's another. I, I would have a managed. I'm not saying you need a managed security provider, but get your cybersecurity in, in whack before you get. That, my opinion is before you move on from an MSP, if you're inheriting one. Make sure your cybersecurity program is intact where you're getting the right data and information from the tools that you've implemented so you know. So to Nate's point, if you're finding poop everywhere, you, you might get alerted on the poop you know, that's out there. And, and, yeah, there may be some things that are misconfigured that are not cybersecurity risks, and who gives a shit about those? I mean, let them die. I mean, it's, it's just a waste of your, your time. Let those things fall off and, and bring the organization to where you think they need to be. Now, if they're embedded in SharePoint, or, or I'm just, I know we're using them liberally here, but is, uh, and they've been using it for two decades or something, <laughs> you know, you got to fix that, right? No, obviously, you know, you you kind of, there's a web there and people are working within it. You got to fix that. But, you know, if you have the opportunity to put in the platforms you need and you're confident in your skills and that you're making the right decisions, you're going to, Build some credibility by putting more scalable systems in place that aren't designed for the three- or four-person company. Um, and that that might be the way that you're able to transition in some respects from an MSP in, in a graceful way where if you still need them for something, uh, you can still leverage them for, for those things while you, before you get that number two or number three or number one. Awesome. This, well, this answered, was an awesome chapter. You answered my second question. So I don't have any more questions. Uh, uh. Basically, I think what we've 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 come to the conclusion at <clears throat> through all this discussion is that uh, at the top level, sort of a macro view, there are MSPs that uh, originally set out to be good, and through no fault of their own, got so big they had to come up with ways to um, streamline. Yeah. To continue to serve their clients and, and make a the profit right right and, and make money and because they do have to make msps money. can't and I'll, this is, we didn't talk about this but msps can't compete with biotech salaries no. for, for it they can't compete no. with uh digital salaries for it like there's no there's no freaking way so there's going to be churn it's just you know it's a like i look at it as um Again, I, I, t I talked to a CEO of an of a MSP not too long ago about this. And he's like, you know what? You just make the assumption that you bring someone who's good. They're going to go out there. They're going to do a great job. And they're going to get a taste of what it's like to do the, pe the work for people that are making more than them who know less than them. And so the, the, the hmm. obvious thing is going to occur to them. That's why I, I love the temp to perm. Like you just mentioned, bringing yeah, a contract to perm is fantastic. Like bringing the temp to perm in, like if, if your organization believes in in developing people and growing them and letting them grow up through the organization, people are like, well, why do you, why you know, why do we need two or three on-site help desk people? If you're a good manager and you develop these people to 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 grow and do new things, whether it's technology or even if they move out into the business, I can think of a handful of people in my career that started on the help desk and stay in IT organization got a great value out of these people and they got a great they got a great career uh educational experience and career boost to that i i do truly believe one thing that's overlooked in it is that it can be a huge development center for the organization you bring someone in to the company 
to be a help desk person. Sometimes maybe they didn't, maybe they don't have a science background or they don't have uh, academic, you know, excellence, you know, and, and all these degrees and whatnot. And they come into the organization, they learn, they learn the systems, but they've also got this great bedside manner and they meet different people in the business and they learn from them. And a lot of companies like to grow people from within, right? It's a great, it's a great thing. I think this, a, because to use the D word, you know, such digital opportunity for people when they come in organizations, both people who are outside of IT and I, in IT, that there are growth opportunities that IT leaders can give people as they come in the organization. If you're successful, they're not in IT anymore. You know, they, they leave IT and they become a business partner that brings the digital skills with them that can run a part of the business. I think there's real value in that. And, and maybe it's hard to quantify from a cost perspective, but having resident knowledge is important at a company. And it's a skill center, I think, that more leaders need to think about in developing their people to let, let them out of the nest and let them grow out into the organization and, and be successful. Not that you can't grow up in IT, you know, like IT too, but I, I think there's people that come in like, oh my goodness, I could, I could be, on, I could work in the sales organization, or I'm really into HR, and that's, I actually found that's really what I like. And oh wait, they know all the HR systems, they know the HR business processes, and now they're becoming a people leader in the people organization, or they're, they're becoming a training expert, right? Like it's, to me, it's, I think sometimes IT is looked at just as the, kind of whether it's a technical leader or a business leader automation, digital, AI, I think individual development is another area where because you're, right, you're at the, the crossroads of, of IT skills, you can bring them in and throw them in the deep end. And, they, and they're hungry, right? And they grow. And you're not hiring that someone who comes in the organization knows everything, right? And then they go in and they do all these great things for the company. And I, I think that's what a, some IT leaders spend more time focusing on is how you develop those people so they can Spread their wings. I got off the soapbox. Well, no, no. First of all, cheers. cheers. That, that was awesome because, honestly, the best people I've ever hired. Didn't know the fucking first thing about life sciences. Yep. And it didn't matter because they had that thing. Yeah. They want to learn. They want to learn. They want to understand. And... I can't tell you how many great people I've been lucky enough to work with. Mm -hmm. Like I'm lucky. I'm an IT leader. I'm lucky. I'm fortunate. So many great people to hire these help desk individuals, these uh, these security folks, these infrastructure folks who have changed my life mm -hmm. because they come in and they're like, I don't know, freaking quality. <laughs> SOP from a, you know, like clinical <laughs> data set. It doesn't sure. matter. They understand. It doesn't matter. You teach them like that. That's the. That's fun. That's simple stuff, right? Yeah, it, it's it, it's exciting too. I mean, you people dig it. You you get you, and you build these relationships and partnerships yeah. that last forever. Like, yeah, it's it's exciting. I mean, every company, and I know you know this, but every company that I've been at and that I've you know had to leave for whatever reason like that's the that's what keeps me at companies is the people is the team is yeah. the these people that you grow to you go through the wars with and and you also go through the great times with and that you build a trusting relationship with and they trust you and you trust them and like that's that's one of the things that really is sometimes difficult different work and jobs and companies and cultures can be that's what keeps you going is if they, they learn something and then you learn something from them. So much, so much. You learn so much from other people. How exciting is it right now that you're on the verge of building a new team? It's awesome. Yeah. Can't, can't, can't wait. I mean, I think that that's uh, very exciting and that I get to work with some new people too. Yeah. Like that's. You get to pick your number one. Yeah. You get to go ahead and build a team. Yeah. I mean, this is, you're, you're going to take people that have effectively limitless potential yeah. it's and, fun i mean set them free and i mean i know we've both been in the situation where we've had you've, you've inherited large teams yeah. there's there's great things about that too there is um I've i mean had I, some, some, I just some think of merger, diamonds in the rough like you, you've had merger scenarios with yeah. uh, i know that we, we've talked about a lot and i've had one as well and like 
was like, Ooh, I don't know how this is going to go, right? You know, who... <laughs> and then you meet people, and they, they're the same as you. They're going through the same stuff. They yeah. have the same concerns, the same worries. You're not alone. Yeah, totally and, true. It's freaking awesome, man. And and that's why it's cool. Like, And I, I don't know if it's just the uh, um, industry we're in, I because I've been in life sciences for the same. I mean, you've been a little bit longer Pretty than me. Pretty much your whole career. 2001. Like and that's what I know. Um, but what a great group of people that i mean we've stayed connected with so many of them well i mean we talked about this last week we had all had our og dinners mm -hmm. in december yeah. for for holidays and i mean this we're going back 20 years i love all my i love all my people i just i Cause i cause you feel bad because i'm not always i don't get in touch enough with them sometimes i how many bad. msps can can look at their staff and say I know, love these people. How many companies is you know MSP walks away and say, "Oh man, I really wish I missed that MSP. <laughs> I really wish that they were still here." You know, just I bet there are some. Well, I think it depends. It depends on a the growth cycle of that MSP. Like, where are they? Because yep. if I'm an MSP and I have my third customer, I'm killing myself. Yeah, I'm killing myself. Yep. to make them happy. Right. Yep. So that, but you're if you're if you're a customer two hundred ninety, then that's I'm not story. killing myself. You're like, oh, it's another one. <laughs> I'm like, okay, how much money they make and uh, who's their CIO? They don't have one. Okay, okay. Boom, yeah. boom, boom. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> um, Great chapter. Uh, so there's some passion in that one. There was you know, just I when I wrote this chapter in 2020, I was at the time. I mean, I still am. I wouldn't say angry. But I still am. Um, I'm in a weird place with MSPs. It hasn't changed, you know. In three yeah. three years now, almost four years, it hasn't changed with the behavior. Like I still, it's still happening the same way it happened four years ago, no. which is the way it happened four years before that. Do you feel like there's external pressure just because of the the trend? Right? Is you know from a I guess depending I mean from a CFO perspective that. I can get one line item for IT for X amount of dollars per year. I can get a cost per employee, even though whether that's valid, you know, 100% well, or not. And, and driving the MSP model down, like for if you get once you hit that 150 mark yeah. or 200 mark, where it's like there's almost pressure to bring one in. Do you see I, that? I, I, or hear about I, it? I, I, don't, I don't see it so yeah. much as I think about that saying, yeah. if you're a CFO, okay, and, and no CFOs are going to watch this podcast, but. <laughs> maybe maybe someone will forward this. If you're a CFO and you're having the debate internally about, geez, do I spend 200 grand to put this MSP in or do I hire somebody? There's no debate. Yeah. Hire your head of IT. There's no debate because your MSP might be 25, 50 grand cheaper than a full-time employee, but you're going to pay in spades down the road. A year from then, it's a mess. Two years from then, you're going to pay up. in spades to not hire. So stop. You got email. It's working. You got file storage. It's hopefully not on SharePoint or Teams, but if it is, it's okay. It's fixable. Fucking hire that head. Stop. <laughs> stop. Like I know people. Just send me an email, Nate at coit.us. I'll tell you people that are qualified to take your role. Don't keep going. It's not. It's, it's on paper. Yeah. It's like this is less than this. I think it's also. The, oh, yeah. I think the other quit. Well, I guess yeah. agreed. The question, maybe an extension of that question is: if you're already the head of IT, you've got your number one, your number two, and there's pressure to bring in an MSP then at lower you, cost. Then, okay, you want my candid but, thought on yeah, that? Yeah, sure. I'd love then it. Then, as, as a head of IT, you fucked up. Like, if you're, what? if there's pressure on you. To bring in an MSP, you did something egregiously wrong. Okay. Why is the business demanding you bring, or the CFO bring you bring in an MSP? What did you do wrong? And it could be, it could be, you picked the wrong company because you got a CFO that can't be fixed, yeah. and that wants like bedside service mm -hmm. uh, on, on their yacht or whatever. Or it could be that you actually have done something significantly wrong, and you need to go back and look at what you did because. Once you're there, yep. Like, and and this is a myopic perspective for me. But once you're in the in, in the company's place, your goal is to 
like bring about an employee experience that's better than what existed. Mm. What about the theory of like, and I'm just playing devil's advocate here a little bit is um, we need to invest in, you know, data warehousing or something like that. Let's say commercial data strategy. That's a good salt. Right. And you know, that, that we need to build an infrastructure. We need to build that out. Um, you know, why, why are we paying for, you know, white glove IT service? Sure. Like that type well, of thing. Well, it's a, it's a bolus of work versus continuity I mean, it doesn't question. mean you did anything wrong. No, it's just I, I understand, business but cha- direction changes or if, business if, conditions. If the business comes to me and says, we'd like to stand up a Tableau environment, right? And I'm not going to ping that because it's not. You don't pingable. know which one to push? I, I, no, no. I just, it's not, not pingable <laughs> or unpingable. It's neither. Let's say uh, it's neither so here nor there. Tableau. It's a, like, I need to stand up X, Y, and Z environment. So I go back to the business and say, okay, A, I can hire somebody who's an expert in this. Yep. That's number one. But it's a, it's a, it's a bolus of work standing up, and then it kind of just runs. Yep. So will they have other things to do? No? Okay. So question two, do I hire a consultant who's an expert in standing up these kind of environments and then handing off to somebody internally? Great. But then question three is, do we have someone internally to hand off to? No. Brings us back to question one. That's right. So, so the question is going to be like, anytime there's an environment that's net new, like I want to stand up X, Y, Z, you have to ask the business, is is IT responsible for this? Yeah. Or are that's you? That's where I was about to go. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want me to stand it up, great. Do you want me to run it too? That's ahead. And that's the thing. A lot of times they, they don't want you to run it, but they want it in your budget. <laughs> well, that's then my dear dear viewer slash listener. Ooh, my, yeah, yeah. My, my, my Keep just, it in your budget. Centralize you, that. Push back. <laughs> Say <laughs> no. Oh, you want to do that cybersecurity thing? Oh, the business is going to pay for Oh, you're not even going to manage it? No, I don't got Oh, you want to put in that. I don't have a sysadmin account. You want to put in oh, that limb it. system that's, three, that's a quarter of a million dollars? <laughs> oh, yeah, no, you you pay for that, right? No, no, no. Push back. Provide reason and logic for. We talked about this already. Yep. Well, we're going to cover it too in the next three chapters. But we're just kidding around. Don't uh, don't buy shit that you can't support. <laughs> That's it. We could have summed it all up with that right there, right? All right. Or that you don't support. Or that you don't support, and definitely don't bring in an MSP to support the implementation ha- of a platform. I think what that leads to is that if you have business partners and everyone should be in the, not not IT business partners, but partners in the business that are implementing these services, they want to turn up a Tableau environment or whatnot. And they come to you. We can stop saying Tableau. Let's say, um, geez, let's say an SSIS SQL server environment. No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, so the big, the big, (laughs) the big, the big thing is, I would say this is where we'll just plant the seed here. Cybersecurity IT governance, right? Just the stuff that comes through IT. You don't need to do everything. You just need to set up the standards. You need to set up the framework. Yeah, that's you, the, 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 head, as, of the as IT, head of IT. The, the IT leader, right? And and then, then it's okay if it's in their budget and it's everything else. And sure. it's, it's totally cool. I, I support that 100%. But there needs to be rules in which how you manage data, and that's where you need to get involved. It's not, hey, I need to implement the system. No, no, no. Here's here's where our data lives. Here's our cybersecurity policy. We need single sign-on. We have enterprise architecture for your bigger company. All those things that we just need to be aligned on. We shake hands. We're going to work this way. Boom. Here you go. And we're out of the way. We're not, and we're not, I'm not, tr- and the worst thing you can be is a roadblock or the red tape. You don't want to be that. You just want unless, to be able to explain the business value to what you're trying to unless do. Unless you're a, a Gartner customer, in which case be the red tape. <laughs> this is a 62 page presentation um we're gonna have a lunch and learn and everyone's like mike what the hell was that um <laughs> I, oh, yeah, yeah, see yeah. i love that shit that i'm in i'm i i'm no, like sitting there like the, no the whole time like oh like seriously i kind of dig that i know you don't love that but i i like it's like reading a what do you dig i just and, this and makes one, me think one bullet point give me give me what you dig uh, he slept. No, I just like the pictures. I like the pictures. I like the pictures too. Um, Nexus of forces. I loved that. 
I love that. What year was that? Um, Digital Crossroads. What, what year was um, Nexus of Forces? 2012? It's, actually, it's, not, it's the marketing. I love their marketing. I always have. Was that 2012? Nexus of Forces? That was... 2013? Something like that. No, that was 08 or 08. That was like... No, no, that was 2013, 2012. Yeah. Because we were talking about it at Cubist. I remember that. Um, Nexus. Of Nexus forces. of Forces is where it all meets. Um, <laughs> digital dexterity. It's not training. It's digital dexterity. I love that shit. I love that. There's so many great t-shirts. Digitaldexterity.com. Nate, no, Nate I, I dig at digitaldexterity.com. And I'm being serious. I think that stuff is great. Like, I'll, we'll play the, the Gartner bingo. The bingo cards. Yeah. We did that one year. We, we went to Gartner Symposium, and we had Gartner bingo waiting for the buzzwords. Do you remember we went to Gartner? That was so much fun. Those, I love Symposium. I had so much fun with those. At Symposium that one year, and we were... They had the Twitter feed up on the uh, big screen. Oh, the IT Expo. We were throwing yeah. the Twitter feed. We were sending stuff up on the screen. We can't tell you what we were saying because uh, uh, so. this is a, um, a family show. Boom, 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 boom. But it was boom. something to do with Docker. Yes, it was. It was. It was Docker. Yeah, they. Were, and that's how it got. It got. It got. Uh, it got disguised that's... because Docker is a. Uh, it's a wonderful virtualization platform. It's in the also cloud. something else. So we were. We were yeah, yeah it's they, khakis, right? The khakis, yeah, Docker khakis. Yeah, There's also right, something yeah. else besides that too, Mike. Oh, really? I have yep. no idea what you're talking it is, about. No. It's well, it's okay. So we were. They had this big thing on the screens, <laughs> and they were showing the Gartner Twitter feed. And Mike and I were in maybe like row seven. I, I think I was drunk. Maybe you weren't. It was only ten in the morning. And um, I was still. I was. St- I didn't you run like sixty miles that morning? Yeah. Then I fine. went to the bar. Oh, I had just woken up. Um, I think. and then we. <laughs> we, were, we were trolling the Twitter feed with all the. Well, we were talking about Docker. Yeah. Yeah. But then they shut it off because people were. Who? Who? You don't have to name his name, but remember one of your guys who went in and hacked the IBM board? Yes. Uh, we, that that guy actually worked with you at, at a at a prior point in time. Ah. Uh, um. Yes. I don't want to say. We, we don't names. have to say. We're not going to name names, but but this person basically hacked the uh, display board that was up in the foyer to, <laughs> at the Dolphin at two thirty in the morning, and they woke up the next day and I don't, can't remember exactly what it said on it, but um, yeah, we were very responsible. I still get people telling me about my speech at Gartner, the Iron Maiden one. No, the one where I was on the I was on the stage with. Um, Black and Decker and and uh, the Windows company. What's the company that makes Windows? Uh, Pella. It was okay. Black and Decker, Pella, yep. and a couple other CIOs. And uh, oh, it, I know which one you're talking yeah, about. Was it? You 10, made a comment it, about the expo. No, it was at 10 a.m. Yeah, and I had just gone to bed at like 4 a.m. and uh, my alarm went off, and I went over there in my Chemical Brothers T-shirt. It was it was Iron Maiden T-shirt. No, it was Chemical Brothers. It was Chemical Brothers. Oh, okay. And my shorts, which I was wearing the day before. Yeah, I was there. I remember that. My flip flops. <laughs> yep. And everyone else was in a suit. Yep. And then the MC said, "So why, why? Oh, so why are you here, at Gartner, this year? Because I was I was in this panel. I said, for for the free beer. That's right, baby. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole crowd was like, <gasps> ah! <laughs> then it was and I'm like, just sitting there like. <laughs> and then I forget what happened the rest of the presentation, but apparently, so when I came off the stage, uh, there was all these people waiting in line to meet me. I tell this story all the time to people. And so Simmons and, and I- they want to meet you. They're Simmons, like, who is this guy? It's 11 in the morning, and I'm like, told Simmons, I'm like, I got to go to the bar. Like, I'm so hungover. So I went to the bar, and we're at the bar in the Dolphin, and people are coming by all morning. Chemical Brothers. And they're like- that was the greatest thing I ever heard. And nice to meet you. And here's my card. And I'm like, I don't know what I said. And Simmons is like, dude. You were on fire. You were on fire out there. <laughs> I was like, I'm just trying not to throw up. And the guy the guy next to you was a prom, maybe it was a Black & Decker. Because he, he was from like a bigger company. Yeah, yeah. And they initially, I think they initially asked him like one question. And then they were having fun with you. Yeah. So they kept asking you questions. Well, that was the and end then, of the and this poor guy is just sitting there like. So, like so, not, they did not so Black and Decker was sweating. Oh, he, he was oh, okay. so nervous to be up there. And so I get up there on stage, and I smelled like bourbon and whiskey and beer and all kinds of things. And I'm sitting next to him, and I joke to him, like, hey, are you drunk yet? And he looks at me, and he goes, 
What? <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, uh, Gardner asked me never to come back. No, they uh, didn't. They love you. No, they didn't ask me that. But I think they love you. They, well, I've, yeah, I don't, I'm not, Gardner doesn't get a plug because they steal everyone else's information. Oh, <laughs> so, all right. I don't, I don't have the so sound that's, effect that's, engine over here. What's my sound effects? Uh, hold on, you all. I have all the sound effects. On the, dun, dun, dun. I'm playing the MacGyver theme right now. I love that sound effect. Nobody knows what it means, though. I just, I Googled, like, random sound effects on the internet. That's a good one. And I found this one, and everyone was like, got all these thumbs up votes. Um, and it was like, top trending in the United States today vote. I don't know what it means. Uh, anyway, so that's MSPs. That's chapter seven. Uh, <laughs> next week. <laughs> Mike, what the fuck? Sorry. Well, I can't do sound effects till you've got... You can do sound effects. Go ahead. Do your sound effect. Hold on. Oh, January Jazz. Nobody can even hear that. Look how far away your microphone is. Do you know how podcasts work? Yeah. There's a cup of coffee and a pine cone. That I just... We can look at. Do you want to just do the rest of the podcast like this? We should probably do it. Yes. Well... (laughs) Nate's like, would you stop... All right, keep going. Welcome to the quiet storm. So, uh, next week, by the way, I have two things I'd say. One, next week we're talking about writing your first budget. And this is a humdinger of an episode because (laughs) writing your first budget is so off the freaking chain. Like when you got to put big numbers with commas. No, it's actually um, going to be... A boring episode. I've read the chapter because I wrote it. Do we amortize that? Yeah. Is that is that is that, is that op-ex? EBITDA or is that op- like what are we? Oh my god! But listen, rolling forecasts. We gotta. We all gotta write budgets, even if it's totally fiction. Like if you wrote a haiku and using numbers, it's probably a better shot at getting an accurate budget for IT in your first year. But anyway, that's next week. Also, somebody gave us five more beers. So, Thank you. To anonymous person who said, I love the podcast, by the way. I love it. That's so great. That's That pays for my liquid dirt. I love it. Michael's Kentucky Owl. And our just good feelings for you. So Thank you very much. Whatever you do, whoever you are, keep doing that. Yes. Because you're the best at it. Don't ever stop, man. Right. And if you or anyone lady. tells you you're not the best at it, kick them in the nuts. Or don't, if they don't have nuts. We don't want to hurt anyone. Kick them in the butt. But with like the heel. Just not, just not with the toe. Maybe like a, a slight slap on the back of the neck or something. Yeah, or just like a how about a disdainful look? Or maybe just like bite your lip and walk away. Here's here's what you do. When they put the coffee cup in their mach- in their machine, and then they walk away to get a banana out of the, like the fruit basket. Just like spit in the coffee cup. Ah, oh, don't do that either. Don't, don't do listen that. to okay. this guy. Jeez, he's gonna get everyone well, sick and in trouble. Uh, uh, well, I'm just trying to like listen. You are amazing. There, everyone else is not amazing. So just be be amazing. All right. Everyone is. Uh, but you, yeah. everyone but you, yeah. is like down here. You're. I can't even like it doesn't even go in the video how high you are in our in our world. Thank you for clicking that button, man. Yeah, I, five I just... beers. Oh my god. That's awesome. I mean I love beer. I can get I can get pretty buzzed in five beers. Mm. This stuff is amazing. I know. Mike. Thank you again. Yes, thank you, anonymous person. You know, if you're gonna leave beers, by the way, and by the way, anonymous is fine. But if you told us even a fake name like just put down like yeah, put something funny in like, like the some, octagon or something whatever like Bobby Tinkle Bobby hey, Tinkle do you remember Bobby or Tinkle Billy Unicorn then and tell us who what like what you want us to say like we'll say yeah. something on your behalf so I remember at at Cubist I had a uh, I had a test user named Bobby Tinkle <laughs> and uh, I remember being in an IT meeting and our head of IT who's a nice gentleman. 
uh, was going down the, we were doing the audit check for the accounts that needed to be disabled. And he, I looked, he looked at me and he says, who the fuck is Bobby Tinkle? <laughs> and I said, Jack kind of like, uh, that's our test user. <laughs> he was not pleased. Um, later we laughed about it, but at the time I think it was kind of like, a, come on, you serious? Um, uh, I would have been pleased. With that. That, that, that was that was nice. And then I think there was someone with the last name Tinkle at the company, and I got my kind of my last laugh. You did? Yeah, there was, yeah. wasn't there a sales guy whose last name was Tinkle? I don't know. I was gone by then. Uh, after the uh, <laughs> after the podcast is over, I'll, I'll I'll let you know about that one. Okay, uh, the name of that one. Well, that we're gonna leave we're gonna leave everyone with a cliffhanger then because next episode, episode eight, no, actually episode seven, where we read chapter eight, we will reveal the secret identity of Joey Tinkle, Bobby Tinkle, Bobby Tinkle. All right, Mike. So S- soon to be followed by Jack Piss. It's two thousand twenty four. Which you've already determined is an even number. Yes, divided by two, baby. Not a prime number. And it's not in the Fibonacci sequence. <laughs> no, well, it might be. We don't know for sure. Things if you lie. know whether or not the 2024 is in the Fibonacci sequence, please send us an email, mike at the cuit.us, nate at the cuit.us, or just post it on the internet. We'll find it. Um, AI, Mike, in 2024. You know what happened? What? Oh. Nobody gave a shit anymore about Gen AI. In 2024. <sighs> but, poor, poor Jenny AI. And the problem with nobody giving a shit anymore, because no one was giving a shit anyway at the end of the last year, is that companies have to write big articles with FUD titles. FUD stands for Fear, Uncertainty, and Doubt, which is what sells news, therefore adds... Oh my God, I burped again. Oh boy. That's two burps in one episode. It's all right. You know, I people, apologize we, we all have viewers. gas. I'm sure some people at home give, have well, gas it was right those now. Chicken, it was those chicken tenders mixed with the whatever the hell unsad salad I had. I was going to say, you know what you don't burp with? Sad salad. My salad. No sad my, salad for you. My salad was jubilate, jubilatious? Jubilatious. Mine was very dry. I, I, I was, did you see me crying while I was watching you eat your salad? Anyway. No lie. He asked me for my order. He says, that's a sad salad. <laughs> He's like, that's a sad salad. And I'm like, that's a Caesar salad. It's just that I'm adding chicken. No, it was, it. it was like if Caesar had um, a dog that had two <laughs> legs and one eye, and that that was the salad you had. It was Ugh. Caesar's uh, beleaguered, crippled dog's salad that you ate. Not Caesar salad. Caesar salad is like a big salad. I couldn't even cut the lettuce up. It was so rough. Anyway, okay, go ahead. All right, well, so... On to the news. So a not-to-be-mentioned uh, industry um, magazine blog company wrote an article <laughs> about how AI is dominating... This, this is the article. AI dominates cybersecurity megatrends for 2024. What? First of all, what the fuck is a megatrend? A trend's a trend. All right, anyway. It's so huge. So this article, and because I'm going to I'm gonna bullshit on the article, I'm not going to say who wrote it or where it's from. But the article is basically, it's citing two sources. The whole article cites two sources. One of them is a co-founder and chief executive officer at a cybersecurity firm. The other source is a founder and CEO at a cybersecurity company. Both companies have like two clients. Anyway... <laughs> The reason I'm bringing this up is because they actually made a salient point in this article. One of which was, and we talked about this last week, the attack on LLMs. You're, 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 you should be shitting yourselves uh, right now over using any AI engine to support your LLM and your company because of the potential for attack on the LLM itself. So from this article... From an attacker's perspective, the AI-based attacks are much more efficient and difficult to spot out. For example, a social engineering attack being carried out with the help of AI technologies will have more convincing language, representation, and deepfakes. Now, that's, that falls into the no-shit category, but the point is that in terms of your phishing 
strategy for 2024 or anti-fishing mm. strategy. Yeah, we have to up our games. Like in 2023, Kate and I, we made some pretty shitty campaigns mm. and people still fell for them. Yeah. But in 2024, our campaigns are probably going to be dead realistic. Do you think that you'll you'll record your own voice as a Slack clip and and make your own asking people to reset their passwords? Not only that, well, that's something we're talking about. We're talking about video. That's what um, I mean. Like we're using we're, AI we're, video. we're we're basically going to show we're going to do a phishing attack of a video showing me. Mm-hmm. There's a picture of me. Yeah. Like take your LinkedIn photo and put it in runway Any photo, on LL. Put, put a picture of me and then have me talk. Yeah. Um, that's coming up. The other part of this article was that, and these numbers are basically made up, but this um, very esteemed uh, <clears throat> firm wrote it anyway because there's no way to substantiate this. 48% of security solution developers expect generative AI to have a strong impact on their strategy within the next five years. Nice big, big time area. As revealed in the study. Whatever study. Additionally, 74% of them characterize their firm's R&D investments as being fully, heavily, or somewhat focused on AI. Which, When you take up fully, heavily, and somewhat focused, what the fuck's the other answer? First of all, when you do a survey, so that's a flawed survey, but here's the question. Besides this, so if we just take this at face value, which is a bunch of writing... How do you think, Mike? Yeah. Generative AI will manifest in your strategy. If like five mm-hmm. years, let's just take five years. Like that's uh, what they say. Too far How do you? Out. Okay, exactly. Thank you very yeah. much. Say no more. Yeah. Who know? Who knows what? Who knows what's going to happen? Like, I, I right. to to some extent, I agree that look, the the cybersecurity companies have to have some AI understanding because <laughs> this shit. I mean, we we're just talking about making video of you, like. We got problems with people clicking links still with, you know, like over the years of. Your Microsoft AOL. password is about to expire. Your, your, oh, shit. Your AOL password is uh, has changed for, you know, it, you know, like that stuff is still getting people. I mean, my my routing number is changing and this and that. Like it's if someone if you're if someone creates your CEO, some voice and their image um, and soon. Uh, I think, you know, right now we're talking about video. Yeah. We're talking about um, text messages or something, you know, that, that that may be automated. Imagine you get a FaceTime call from, hello. What the hell? It's a ghost in here. Oh, my God. Um, let's say you get a FaceTime call from your CEO. It's a ghost of Kevin Dishney. Right? Right? You get yeah. a FaceTime call from the CEO? No, no, I buried Kevin Dishney in the backyard after last week's episode. Oh, That's Kevin Dish, the ghost of Kevin Dishney. Yeah. But your CEO calls you on FaceTime and, and, and asks you to go buy Target gift cards. No, just kidding. Um, asks you to do something. And you ask it a question and it responds back to you. Like, this is where we're headed. Yeah. You know, we're, and I guess my, I'm not really making much of a point here, but I guess nope. if, if I can make a point. Yep, that'd be nice. <laughs> um, how the hell are you going to defend against that? Well, how, how are you going to do it with if, if you're security, cyber security people like oh, AI is a joke. We're not going to focus on that. Yeah, but if you didn't already start, Mike, like, like, like for the uh, to this detect back, this goes back three companies. to detect it to detect three it. companies. The every single the last three companies I've been at when we have our phishing attacks simulations, yeah, we have our post op with the company. The slide is in every single deck that says do not trust anything. You always have to verify. That's right. Trust but verify. No, no. But then don't trust. And uh, honestly, ask Kate. This is on our slide. It says trust but verify, period. Then don't trust. Because even then, unless I'm looking at you in the face physically. Great point. I cannot assume that what you sent me is real. And that's where we're going. So my concern is that (laughs) you, you can't. Right now, I could pick up the phone and call the CEO and say, hey, did you just call me? And he could say no. But what if it's a, it's already a call? I mean, you're going to have to double check everything every exactly. time someone calls you. You have to double, Was that really you, Nate? Is that really you? 
So uh, like that, I don't know how we're going to deal with that. So 2024, here's a prediction. I know we're not talking about predictions in the show, but I'm going to make I one. I love predictions. Nope. We're going to oh. go back to a, a thing that was used in the early 2000s, which is you're going to have an ID and a number. Yes. Uh, Verification is, code. Okay. What's your code? Yep. And you will you have, have to go now. fish out your code out of your wallet or whatever you got and say, my, my name is my password. And then we'll my name you. is Werner Brandis. <laughs> my voice is my passport. Verify me. Yes. Well done, sir. Sneakers, um, baby. Sneakers. Great movie. Yes. The ghost of Kevin Dushney has <laughs> left. He is no more. Um, that's where we're going. And you know what? Whenever we – here's another thing. You can, you can. This episode is going to be marked in time because I'm going to say something right now which will outstand the ages, which is no matter how far ahead we advance in all other innovations, we will always come back to the very, very most basics in security, which is, are you Mike? I'm, I'm Nate. Yeah. Okay, now I can trust you. Now let's do this thing together. You have a key. I have a key. Yeah. We'll both stick them in and we'll launch the, the Ooh, code. We can open it. I think one other piece of this that's that's tough is, you know, you're talking about verification codes is whenever the CEO calls, like, hey, um, Mr. CEO, can I have your verification code? And the awkward exchange yeah. that people have, like, socially, like, it's like like, uh, like tailgating when someone walks into your office. Yeah. You know, like, you shut the door in their face because you can't let them in. Nobody does it, right? So it'll be the same type of challenge we're going to have. Uh, I think with some of this stuff is if we're going to do all this verification is going to be, uh, you, you get it. There's tons of bad AI out there. These fake people, I got to make sure you're you. And it, well, maybe that's what generation alpha will bring to us. It's so, like, Hey, verification. Hey, nice to meet you. Is that you today? Are you sure that's you? And uh, like, uh, we're having a way to verify. That's why right. it'll be socially acceptable is I guess what I'm trying to say right now. It's like, Oh, you don't trust me. What do you mean? Well, that's why Mike and I use a secret code of C Tech Astronomy when we're that's right when we're confirming that the other person's there. What were some of the other ones? C Tech Astronomy. There's a couple funny ones that they couldn't use. I remember it, and I'm not going to say it. Why? Because I don't think it's 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 appropriate. What is it, Mike? Go ahead and say it. I'm going to look it up and say it anyway. All right. It's uh, it's it's Cootie's Rat Semen. <laughs> That's what it was. I remember that's in the script. <laughs> I know, but I wanted you to say it out loud. I know. You just like me feel uncomfortable. Yes. Okay, so <laughs> so now that was 2024. Uh, so welcome to the new year of uh, AI FUD. And um, you're going to basically, the next two months, here's a foreshadow. Next two months, you're going to see nothing but articles about is Gen AI, Gen AI the next thing? Is it going to be disruptive? Is it going to change my company? Is it the, oh my God, we're going to die? It's none of those things. It's a stupid thing. It's never gotten past clever. Listen, the, the apex of technology was when we learned how to use a hammer to kill a small animal. Ever since then, every advancement's just been nothing more but a, a, another check on the clever meter. But at the end of 23, I had an article over here in my pile of articles, which I forgot to talk about. No more secrets, Marty. <laughs> no more secrets, Marty. No more secrets. And um, this article actually is relevant because if you have been a victim of Samuel shaming <laughs> over the last five years, and if you have, you know what I'm talking about, which is you're like, oh, my God. Uh, I got this new SSO platform, which I won't name, which is an industry standard public company, and it's freaking awesome. I love it. But I want to <laughs> add my little rinky-dink four-user um, SaaS app to it. I have to buy the enterprise version to get SAML connectivity? What a, I, I, this drives me nuts. I know. This drives me nuts. Yeah. And so what happened was over a period of the last, I don't know, five, six years, all these companies were like, hey, holy shit, like we can make a premium if we just add on the fact that adding SAML is so hard 
to our yeah. platform. It's all pre-baked. Oh, all this oh stuff. my God. All this coding we got to do like every day. Let's do, an, let's do an engagement. Yeah, let's do an engagement. We'll, we'll show you how to add SAML to your environment. All right, I want you to uh, cut cut that, yeah, uh, and uh, and paste so, it in. So uh, yeah, if you if you don't have yet PTSD <laughs> from your SAML shaming bullshit period, <laughs> which won't end anytime soon, here's a new shaming that's coming. It's the AI shaming period, and there are Ooh. vendors that are like, money, 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 why money. would I give Mike? free AI no, when I can no. charge him a couple extra bucks per seat to do the same shit that we've already built. So uh, there's an article and this one actually came from another reputable online technical e-zine called Computer World. You might have heard of it. Computers. And by the way, for the record, I used to subscribe to their hard copy computer world. We got it in the basement at TKT. I remember that. And along with the uh, Computer Week. Computer Weekly. Computer Weekly and Info Week. Info or, Week. And in, or Info World, whatever it was. We got Mac World, too. Mac World. We got those in the in TKT bullpen, and we would like pour through them in 10 minutes, and then go back to Slash Dot and read the actual real news. Anyway, <laughs> so Matthew Finnegan wrote on December 12th this article but called Making Sense of Gen AI Pricing in Office Apps. So uh, I'm remiss in not dealing with it then, but, you know, it was the holiday season. And I didn't want to bring everybody down. Mm. Um, so anyway, it's a good article. He goes on to write a bunch of things. I'm going to just skip through and cover the, my, my favorite parts. Um, I can dig it. So he starts off, like one part of the article is about who's charging what for Gen AI. So... The first vendor to do this, uh, based like on, on what I could find, and of course what he could find too, is Notion. I love Notion. Notion's awesome for like a billion different reasons. But Notion in February of 2023 started charging users ten dollars extra per month just to get the little AI Gen AI feature. Okay, good for Notion. Out of the gate, someone's got to be the first one. Um, and then there was. Uh, Microscam, I'm uh, sorry, uh, Microsoft, who in uh, a little bit later on in the year launched Copilot. Co-piss or co-pink, co whatever you want to call it. Copilot. Copilot for 365 with a listed price of $30, $30, $30 per, per user on top of E3 and E5 subscriptions. Now, I'm an E1 company. And if you don't know what E1 versus E35 is, it doesn't matter. But anyway, I'm like at the bottom of the barrel. You, you guys are E1, right? Nope. You have a couple. E Wait, what? We have a few. Yeah. You have a couple E3s. I have one E3. Whatever. Anyway, $30 per user. Away. $30 per user to get better bullet lists. Um, so, so then. So why, So they have to pay an API fee to open all these companies, right? Yeah. So that's that's why they're charging. But they're charging like three times what it costs probably, right? Right. Three times? Like a hundred like times. Yeah, it's a lot, right? I mean, it's yeah. gonna be crazy. The instructions are pretty. I mean, the instructions are pretty straightforward. Like you can do it yourself. You don't need. Yeah, yeah you can use the API. Pay twenty dollars a month yeah. per user. So then, this is the one that killed me, because mm -hmm. I'm. I love Google. Google. I don't know. I'm shaking my head. So Google launched. Do it. Do. Do it. Do it. Do it. <laughs> Just do it. I. I. Every single time I talk to somebody, I'm like, it's do it. It's, it's duet. duet. Let's sing a duet right now. Let's Google launch duet AI. Let's not sing duets. separate lives. Oh, uh, for thirty dollars, <laughs> on top of um, the Google Workspace account fee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. However, like most Google things, they didn't actually charge the fee. They just kept everyone in like beta. So if you sign up for duet. AI and Google Do Workspace. It. You didn't actually pay the thirty dollars per head. Yeah. You just had this cloud hanging over you. But still, no Google, pun intended. Come on, you own half of the internet. You need to do that. So anyway, so you think it should be much cheaper, as in free? Yes, free. Because then we come to our next vendor, who.
play. Oh, he's going he, back he, to my sub. You need a mouse. <laughs> Jeez. Are you like a trackball guy? Do you no, still I'm have... not a left-handed trackpad guy. I won't take this job unless I have a trackball. <laughs> I just gotta press a button. I gotta Remember make a, that? I gotta, I gotta make a button. Remember the, there was a... I need a trackball. You must. You put. <laughs> I need a trackball on either side, plus four monitors. <laughs> So Zoom. Whatever happened to trackball? So ball. Zoom, Zoom, good for you. Don't don't charge for AI companion. Now I've disabled it for my whole company because it's idiotic. But good for you for not charging for it. Okay, go ahead. No, I, I was going to say. Be, be, like, be the contrapunto. No, I'm not going to be contrapunto. All I'm going to say is. I don't know say it. Go ahead. I, I mean, it's a counterpoint, but it's an. No, Italian. this isn't a. This isn't a uh, counter. Well, it's not a counterpoint. It's actually a little bit of like a maybe think about Zoom, and uh, Zoom by the way is not a sponsor, so don't say their name too many times. Okay. Um, I like AI. No, I'm just kidding. I I, I think uh, the fact they include it is a is a is a good thing, and you can shut it off if you want. Yes. It's 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 okay that you can turn it off. It's not in beta. Um, it'll be it'd be really. Imagine if it could count down how many minutes are left in the meeting. Uh, Blue Sky does that. <laughs> Blue Sky. That's a joke. I was kidding. I wasn't. Blue Sky. I love Blue Sky. Big props. You know who else does free AI? WebEx. WebEx has AI? <laughs> are you kidding? <laughs> really? Yes. What WebEx? do they do with it? They have, I don't know, I don't use it, but they have it. Everyone know. like, I don't know. Your and next meeting will be attended was, by six people, even though uh, you've invited 12. Uh, this is our prediction. I was just looking for vendors that fell in, and they came up. Mike, don't, don't hate so much. I don't hate, I, I think including. Well, uh, okay, and Coda, Coda also does not have, does not charge. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, Coda's, I like Coda. <clears throat> Now on the box, box customers. I like box. For full cool. disclosure, I like box. <clears throat> box. You can only get box AI if you've uh, on the enterprise tier, and Ka-ching. and it caps <laughs> your users at twenty queries a month. However, there's a pool of two thousand that everybody can use in the organization. Uh, so if somebody is like very prolific querier, they can pull from the pool. But I think that's pretty decent. I mean, write three, poem three thousand times. <laughs> uh, so if you're not a box enterprise customer, it sucks to be you. Um, but anyway, so sadly, uh, do it. The author of this article cited Gartner, uh-uh. and. Craig Roth, who's a VP of something at Gartner, said Gen AI is quite expensive to offer, although there's no... um, He goes on to say, it costs a lot of money whether you license one of the big LLMs or try to create your own. There's a lot of processing power involved. There's no thought thing to substantiate this claim. Uh, It's just just going to the fact that people are stupid. They're going to read this and go like, oh yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, It's not... You don't think it costs a lot? Not at this scale. Not, Not at this scale? No. Um, not the scale when you're already making... Well, we'll get to this. Yeah, yeah. So Roth goes on to say, on the customer side, the value part is vague, which I agree with. Exactly what am I getting out of this? If you're just using to improve your productivity to convert paragraphs into bullets <laughs> or start your emails for you, it feels great. But exactly what is the value you're getting out of it? Can I put a dollar amount on it? And the answer is no. Oh. That's a rhetorical question. Yeah. Uh he goes on to say a bunch of other shit. Uh, but the question is, how will this all play out? And then there's a sub-question to that, sort of a meta question, which is, why do vendors feel all of a sudden it's necessary to have a Gen AI component? Uh, either there, it's one of two reasons, and this is not rhetorical, you can go ahead and answer, but yeah. one of two reasons, either they feel like Gen AI is going to make their product better, or they feel like they just... If they don't have a Gen AI product, yeah. that they're going to miss out. It's FOMO. Yeah, FOMO. Yeah. yeah. All right. 
Okay. I, I, I think that's a part I agree of it. with you. Yeah, I think if they don't have it right now, they're like, oh, whatever, we're behind the curve. Unless you're Apple, and they're, they're basically going to make everyone laugh, I think. Let me ask you a sub-question. Yeah. What if Wait I till it's what ready. If, what if I'm a vendor, and I'm like, shit, i got to say I have Gen AI, and I say I have Gen AI, but I don't? Yeah. Doesn't matter, right? I, I think we're at the top of the hype cycle, and it's, the stuff oh isn't... Oh, my God. We're not going to... We're not going to... People aren't going to... We have, to, that, we have to pay someone like a hundred thousand dollars that you said that. We're at the top of the hype, the hype cliff, the, the hype cliff, whatever we want to call it. The hype cliff. LL, uh, the trademark uh, Long Walk Consulting and the Calculus of IT dot com twenty twenty four. All I'm saying is that uh, I think right now people have it because people are like, oh, I need AI. AI well, is such a big deal. Hold on, because Roth goes on to say Roth of of Gartner says. Roth also estimates that premium prices are likely to hold for the next six months, which is not to say in the, into, the, into Q3 of 24, <clears throat> at least, perhaps even a year before they start to fall. This is because underlying technologies, namely the high-end chips used to power LLMs, again, I think this is a relatively um, low-hanging fruit assertion. There's other things at play here, but whatever. Mm -hmm. This is the audience we're talking about. are set to become cheaper and more efficient. And then he says... Looking a bit further out, it's likely that Gen AI will simply become table stakes or any productivity or collaboration software package. Now, it's a commodity. Exactly. What's that? Um, there's a law. I, I wish I looked it up. Murphy's Law? No, the other law that says that every application will eventually have email. Um, the law of diminishing returns. No, 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 no. Hold the on. law of email. I know what you're saying. These things are, these things are staple on, I mean, Think of AI as a competitive advantage tool. Like that, you know, how are you discovering drugs? How are you building a better product? You know, your software company, you, you sort of have to have it now. To, Zawinski's to Law. Zawinski's Law. Zawinski's Law. Every program attempts to expand until it can read mail. <laughs> that will be the same thing here. Yep. Every SaaS platform will attempt to expand until it has AI. McBride's yep. Law. McBride's Law. I love it. I love it. Now I'm burping. Gold estimates, and this is Jack Gold, by the way, who is the founder and principal analyst at J. Gold Associates. I love that name. Jack Gold? Is that his name? Yep. I estimates, and I don't know who he is or why he was quoted, but he estimates that in a time frame of around three years, Gen AI will be an integrated capability in most productivity suites. Probably true. It's like, blah, 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 it's like blah, Clippy. Blah. Uh, but accessing Gen AI doesn't have to require significant investment. Gold says, there are other ways of doing this. You can do things like give Word and PowerPoint text and tell it to summarize it or turn it into bullets, modify the tone or whatever. This is a quote. Yep. And then paste it back. Okay, so... So don't pay any extra money for Gen AI now. There's no point anyway because all your platforms will have collaborative They'll AI have it in built the next in. months. Yep. So don't pay any money for Gen AI. Bullshit. Wait three years. And that's why you're seeing them offer it to like the big seats, right? You're seeing Microsoft thirty dollars a month. You have a three hundred seat plus. That's why because they're going to offer it for free eventually. Because they it's spent like, big, like they big spent enterprise twelve point fifty five trillion on buying OpenAI. To justify their purchase, and and we haven't even you you, you were mentioning uh, SLMs last week, right? Yes. So um, once things get local, because I think local. No, nope. uh, there's no local, Mike. What do you mean local? What's local? On device. On, on device, device LL LLMs. On device. Where would they be stored? On your phone, on your watch, on your but, on but your just, computer. Just even even like the most basic, like even a Llama Two is a. Too big for my phone. The the basic pared down version. Not 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 in three four years. I don't think it will be. Because phone storage will go up, or because the, bit, size bit, of the LMs will go down. Both. Or SLMs will be more available. Both. Yep. Absolutely. So I have to give up half, disc, half disc my will... phone storage to support an SLM for my no, company. No, I, I think it'll be augmented with the cloud, and I think it will. Some of it will be local, and some of it won't. It'll pull down when it needs when it needs it, and uh, I I. I think privacy, like this stuff with the New York Times and all that, 
is going to trigger, you know, if they lose especially, is going to trigger a localization of some of this stuff. Uh, edge, edge, edge AI. Let's call it that. Trademark. Oh, Mike. Edge AI, baby. Right. So, but you know what I'm saying, right? Let's talk about Edge AI for a second. Last week and the week before that, you spurned my attempts to get you to talk about browsers as a service. But now I'm, call, oh, okay. I'm calling you out. Okay. Because Microsoft, Microsoft marketing. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Ha, <laughs> ha. You'll notice this one. And you'll notice this one on your Windows 11 machine. In their infinite wisdom. Oh, it's just an iOS and Android. That's right. Made Edge AI Browser. They've just renamed it. Renamed it. So if you download AI browser, if you download Edge in the Play Store and the App Store, it's now the Edge AI browser. Or as I like to call it, Edge Edge AI, Edge (laughs) AI browser. I just I was like, oh come on! Everyone knows that. It's like, can you just give it a rest? And come on, we get it because you're infantile and you don't know better. But it's a freaking web browser. It's that chromium. You, that you annoy the shit out of people who start up a new Windows 11 machine to use. Stop. And freaking Outlook. Yeah, just stop. I click a link in Outlook and it opens in the edge. So another. It's no, you can, but I got to show you how to I fix know, that. You, you can get around it, but you shouldn't have to is my point. Uh, I know, but that's, that's the, ridiculous. That's the next 10 years of our lives is going to be undoing little tiny check boxes because, so silly. because a, a giant behemoth... Of a the MSP can do that for us. Poop emoji is trying to. The MSP should do it. <laughs> Let them configure it, push that group policy or whatever, an in tune policy or whatever now. And we'll Welcome to the Calculus of IT. In this episode, we're talking about using your MSP to thwart all of the bullshit Microsoft <laughs> throws at you. My Re- you gotta co-host re- is Mike Crispin. You've got to rewrite that chapter. There's no question about it at this oh point. Oh my God, that chapter's so old. You've got to rewrite it. That's like, just use it to circumvent. It's literally, IT. it's literally like a one paragraph chapter. Microsoft now. IT policies. <laughs> so um, yeah. when you're when dealing with your MSP, just simply have them thwart all Microsoft policies and updates until Microsoft dies. They're getting bigger, man. They're they're unstoppable right now. Yeah, I know. They're bigger than ever. And you know what? There's no, some of the stuff no... they do is pretty cool. <laughs> I can't believe I said that, but I, I I do think there's some things they do that are good. Like Xbox. No, I'm just, <laughs> just He hates made, when I say anything that's from Microsoft. Um, nope. Three things? Yep, three things. Three things that are nice? Nope. Viva Engage. No, that's not a nice thing. Um, no, no, about Microsoft. Microsoft. Three things. Um, nice things. Um... You can you can just put it in and no one will get mad uh, at you. That's one. It's half of one. It's a, it's not. It doesn't even feel like a good thing. It's like, oh, just it's a commodity. Just put it in. What's the big deal? Like you should focus on other stuff. You know, who cares? Just Microsoft. Everyone uses Microsoft. You know, so that's a good thing, to some extent, if you think about it that way. We all breathe oxygen too. So that's I right. suppose I suppose it's a good thing. What else? Um, Power BI. I'm not a big fan of. Um, Office 365, and I, I don't like PowerShell. Um, hey, I got one for you. Which one? Um, Microsoft okay. Project. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like I Visio. Mean, Actually, Visio, I could. I like Visio, using Visio. Shut the fuck up. I do what like about, the new Outlook client. Yes, because oh. it's the web client that yes, we've been using for the last four which years. Which is awesome. Actually, the web client is very good. It's not awesome. It's just it's it's better. It's acceptable. Except, what? Okay. Hey, Mike. What about OneNote? How do you I do, OneNote? I do not like OneNote at all. It's but, a vi- it's a cybersecurity nightmare. Yeah, yeah. Not only is it a cybersecurity nightmare, but it's um Let me share all my stuff outside the company. Let me download my OneNote notebook with all yeah, the files in it that I've attached. Let me take my OneNote with me on my Oh wait, I can't. It doesn't work on my little miniature Oh, I'm using MAM. pocket device. I set up MAM to protect us from that. Oh. Oh. But um I can still download it. Oops. Yeah. Oh, there's an embedded link? Oh, I didn't see that. Oh, it's too bad. Oh, I need Teams to open. Oh, man. And SharePoint? Oh, fuck. You know what I do like? And 
I'm oh, not well, a... I asked you for a, a bullet list of three. You've given oh. me zero. Oh, I. Okay. Um, well, no, you gave me you gave me kind of one. This is a, a, opinions. That's okay. Um, I, if you have the time, which nobody does, I think SharePoint. There are things you can do in SharePoint lists that are interesting. What did you just say? There are things in SharePoint lists you can hold on. do. My. I know you hate SharePoint lists. Let me hold on. I you my, got, my my headphones like no, it's weird over You've got to learn how, how all the stuff that happens. It's very complex and it's not a good continuity story. But it's if you need to do something quick, you can do it in a list if you need to. Remember, I was a SharePoint architect for a bunch of years, so like the, there's some things in there that you can use for low cost. What? Instead of buying Smartsheet, for a minute. instead of buying Smartsheet or yeah. some other product or yeah. even Airtable, like you can build basic stuff in the list without breaking anything, if you want to, and it works fine. Who the fuck are you? I mean, I mean I'm just I saying. I don't, some, I don't even know you. There are little nuggets of stuff if you go through it, look at it. That All you right, can use. okay. Well, um, just one little piece. I'm Amy Bright. I don't know who this is over here. I don't know what happened. I'm not that. allowed to say a nice thing about Microsoft. Come on. Go ahead. No, say something nice. But I did. No, I you did. didn't. You said that that lists somehow are they're functional things. They're, yeah, it's just something. If you don't have anything but else, in order to have fine. a list, you have to have a site. Yeah, but you don't need to show the site. You can hide all that stuff. Yeah, but you still need someone to show and hide all the stuff. Yeah, you do that in five minutes, and you set it up, and you create a list. Five minutes. List is now an app on your phone. It's you don't even need to uh, in, um, show SharePoint. They did it to copy Smartsheet and Airtable, and it's just a, a knockoff. But if you don't have anything else, if you can't convince people to buy Smartsheet or or Airtable or anything, then you know it works fine. Convince them. Basic stuff. All right. I love the other stuff better. Listen. You know I'll me. I'll give I'll give that one to you. Okay, thank I'll you. Give that one to you. I'm trying so hard here. Look. Just... Oh well, you didn't mention paint. No paints. Uh, mm. Oh man. And Clippy. Man. Browse... Microsoft Edge is right. the best, though. That's okay, so best. once again, you've done your best to circumvent. Oh no, no. Okay, Edge browser service. Yes. Um. Are are are, are four like my mom wants to understand browser service? So yeah, I, I, my mom too. She's mentioned the same thing. So now you're just uh, enterprise browser, right? So it's a managed, branded Chromium browser. There's a couple companies that do it that I know of right now. Uh, there's three, actually. Um, Plug them. I'll, and I'll hit it. Go ahead. So, so one, one that, the one that I, I think I dig the most is called Island I.O. That's a good one. And Talon is another one. Um, and then there's components of Chrome... Um, management suite that can do some great things not not so much as not as much you need to pair it with like a zscaler or something but um and then there's edge right edge and in tune <laughs> come on you're not quick enough um thank you <laughs> <laughs> anyway so the, the long story short too late it's it's really about creating a, a browser that links up with your identity service so that you're creating a doorway in your organization that goes to all of your SaaS applications but gives a dependency on the local device, right? So you you can install this enterprise browser and it can potentially give access, take all your web filtering rules into effect, all of your firewall rules into effect, um, and all your allowed sites, as well as only allowing access to my apps or Okta or Ping Identity or whatever you want to use, strictly tied to that browser. So you can you can use whatever you want to authenticate to it, uh, and you can glass box basically all your applications. The downside is that you've got to work in the browser, but that's becoming more and more of a reality. Uh, more and well, more of your applications are a, web a year, a year from now, you will be All Microsoft will be. More than urged to use Office within the browser. Yes, which is a great thing. There's a lot of good reasons for that, I think. So do you Security think, perspective. Do you think the, the browser as a service uh, accelerates our move towards um, OS-less devices or os light devices, like a Windows 12 yeah. type uh, device that has no capability to run FAT32 or FAT or, or, or any other FAT apps? 
Absolutely. Yeah, I, I look at the gaming services like the NVIDIA GeForce gaming service and the Xbox Pass, and you're seeing them stream these 100 frame per second games yeah. at 4K. There's no re and it's unbelievable performance. There's no reason why we can't stream a desktop computer with some applications um, without spending an arm and a leg on the GPU processing and doing it all through the browser. So, yes, I think the Chromebook vision, um, I think people will take the open source Chromebook model yeah. and they will create products. I mean, it's totally open source, and I think we'll finally see, if, if even that, I, th I think that's if you don't have a computer. I think what will largely happen is people will just be able to use whatever computer they want. They'll use the browser. It will do some sort of threshold check against where their computer stands from a, uh, whether it's patching or it's accessibility or the wireless network they're on, and will allow you in. So the behavior is when you go through the browser, the enterprise browser, whichever one you choose, you log into the environment, and when you get in, I'm going to use Okta. When you log into Okta, you can get to all your stuff. If you go home or you go on, to, you close that browser in your home computer and you open Chrome and you go to that Okta site, you may not even be able to log in depending on what your policies are. But if you can log in, um, all of the icons in Okta will have a lock on them. You won't be able to click any of them because you don't have the enterprise browser. So that's great because now I, hey, I need to onboard 25 contractors. I don't want to buy them a laptop. But you're going to send them the browser and they're going to open the browser. They're going to go through a verification process. They're going to sign the acceptable use policy. Yeah. They're in. They're into Okta. They have an account. They've got a remote desktop if they really need it. Hopefully, we don't need that. Um, but they've got access to their web applications. And both of these vendors, for example, um, all have encrypted storage within the device. So Chrome has an open source file system that's built into Chromium. And you can use that to store files encrypted within the browser on a local drive. Uh, and they both do that. So you can keep the files local and work on them. So this is, I think, the emergence that a lot of people have been like, I want like VDI, I want the best of both worlds. Yeah. And I think this is as close as we've gotten. Um, but you've got to get people in the browser. And I think that's the challenge in our industry where we still have a lot of lab instrumentation and a lot of systems. But if we can get them into a VDI environment, um, you know, that defeats the latency issues that sometimes we have with lab systems. I think there's a huge value and a better better user experience too. Where it does hurt is for the organizations that are Mac heavy or that are graphic graphic artists or whatnot. You know, they need local resources uh, and they still need the client applications. Uh, I think we all experience maybe with our kids the Chromebook experience and how that might be not the most wonderful user experience with some of the applications. Web applications aren't the best at that. Um, so I do think that We'll have to get around some of that. And the other one is Zoom, I believe, is still pre... They have a, a, a PWA web application, but it's not really usable. Yeah. Um, so you're going to have to have a way to do video <laughs> conferencing through this thing, which is if, uh, obviously if you have Teams or you have uh, Google Meet, um, you can do all this stuff pretty easily within the browser with a good experience. So, the, so the, the, the big question is, or not the question, but the thought is, how does this begin? Because... The things you mentioned, from a downstream perspective, yep. you have um, BYOD impacts, yep. where it doesn't matter what the employee brings to the table. Yep. We can go back to the stipend models. Yep. We can, whatever, it doesn't matter anymore. Like the, the machine becomes an irrelevant thing, a piece of plastic. Just the window, the browser. Right. You have management impacts, which is I need less FTEs to manage this. I, I'm talking about now uh, policy across the board, yep. uh, managed at a browser level. Yep. You have DLP control or better DLP control. Nothing can be taken out of the browser. It doesn't present screenshots, but it does. Um, it can. Uh, it can record screen screen uh, sessions, too, if you, you want to. Yes, uh, at least one of the products does. Yes, and yep. then you have the, mentioned the video conferencing um, effect. I mean, these are things that are going to drive other technologies. So, yeah. if you want to solve, for instance, the video conferencing problem, well. The problem already, the solution already exists. Mm -hmm. It's manifested itself in other ways. Like I can do video conferencing, say through Slack, or I can do video conferencing yeah. through uh, Meet. Uh, Google Chat or, or Google Meet. Meet works great in the browser. Um, so, so there's Teams. Teams. There are, there are workarounds the for this, and so Zoom 
has to either concede a portion of its market share or rethink the way it does the work. Mm -hmm. But the browser process, uh, I think of it as um, like a very big straight line <coughs> shovel that's pushing mm -hmm. and it's going to push everything else to accommodate. Because, and this was the yep. essentially the flag we've been looking for this whole time, mm -hmm. is the conversion of Microsoft Office FAT32 apps to web apps. Yep. That is the thing that's going to change everything else. Yeah, it is. And uh, will yeah, allow for the justification. Like if all my users are using uh, Office Outlook and Office Calendar in a browser, then there is no longer a need for me to pay for premium or standard uh, uh, yep. licenses in an yep. E1 set. Everyone's going to the browser. Yep, and, and to some extent that's the big play for Teams is because that, te for them, is they realize that Microsoft uh, Office Word Excel going into the browser yeah. puts them on a part, because they can't replicate all the same features. They may get to parity at some point, but Teams is the hook, the temporary hook that keeps you in the office for a lot of companies, because that will keep people on the platform instead of going to Google or going to some other, there's so many good best, of, like Canva and some of these other yeah, yeah. tools that are out there that will keep people locked into that ecosystem of tools because Teams hooks it all together and Outlook hooks it all together. So those two things are sticky, and it will allow us, though, to your point, to adopt a browser-friendly model. I think Chromium is almost as important as the invention of Linux. Like, the whole Chromium platform has allowed so much innovation, and it will be on the iPhone next year, and it'll be really interesting to see how that, I mean, I think the EU is going to make sure that happens. Mm -hmm. And when it's on the iPhone, I know that companies like Island.io and Talon are going to be doing jumping jacks because... Uh, the Safari, iOS, or WebView versions <laughs> aren't anything to write home about. And once they're able to put Chromium on the iPhone or yeah. onto the iPad, it brings all those capabilities to those devices. Um, and that's really where the cloud, kind of, with Linux, kind of uh, created such growth and capability from a cybersecurity perspective. I think Chromium will do the same thing. The, the flip side of all this, and, and this is a question I can't answer yet, is... Well, Google and Microsoft could do this so easily. They could build these controls in. They could build a web filtering engine. They could do all this stuff pretty simple with in the browser, I would imagine, on their own and include it with the SKU that they're selling us. So what I, I, I am curious how the sort of these, these um, innovative uh, new companies that are building these things are going to not get Sherlocked. <laughs> yeah. Because, like... I, I can't. You, I look at the edge controls inside of Intune, for example. It's like you could do all. You could build like rules, firewall rules, and they could just build a portal that does that. This is all open source, so yeah. that's the thing I, I get uh, somewhat concerned about. But what I have seen from these platforms, and I know uh, a company that's implemented one of them. Um, it's it's been very successful, and I'll give you the comparison. The way that 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 I've because I was had a hand in some of it, is um, this is like when, and I'm going to use the O word again, this is like when Okta came out. The biggest thing with single sign-on for us was, oh, God, activate, Active Directory. Integrating with Active Directory, what a nightmare. This is such a pain in the butt. You know, we got to figure out how to do this. And every vendor had us uh, opening ports in the firewall, and we need to put agents on the AD server, and we got to do all this stuff. And uh, Okta in a five-minute demo in, you know, 2012, you know, had us imp put a, have a test domain controller install an agent and did a reverse proxy. And we were up and running in five minutes. Yep. This is one of those things where the user experience is going to improve for people because they're going to go into the browser, they're going to go right to their intranet or right to their homepage or right to their Okta page. And in one of these products, when you open a new tab, Okta is fully integrated locally. It's so the, it's the ODA component of it's, Okta. It's yeah, it's fully integrated yeah. to, uh, to the local the local browser, and it just creates a better user experience. And people are like, "Hey, I get it. Like, I get it. I have one place to go. I know where all my stuff is. I know that." And, and more and more uh, employees are concerned that they're doing the right thing, and that they're being you know they're being safe and they're following the rules and whatnot. Yeah. And now they just go to one place. And they know they're in the right place. That's right. Uh, and I I think it's going to be interesting. It's getting a lot. Both companies are getting a lot of attention. 
Um, I think the the question is, you know, will one of either they be acquired? One of them already has been acquired um, by uh, Palo Alto, right? Talon got acquired by Palo Alto. Um, but what's going to happen if if you know Google does this as part of Workspace or Microsoft builds us in the edge into Intune? Um, it probably won't be as good as <laughs> either one. There'll be like a, a a shadow of what these companies are doing. But it will be enough yeah. for people to invest. Well, and the 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 Mozilla's and the Blazes of the world will still be fringing. Yeah. Mozilla, like that's a great story. I, I know, but it's just not been taken advantage of enough for business. I I use it for maybe a third of my work, and Blaze for a third, and then Chrome for the rest. And Brave, yeah. or Blaze, Brave, Brave. I'm sorry, Brave is my default. I love Brave, um, and. And I, honestly, I was introduced to Brave by an MIT professor I met, and we had a great conversation about it, and I decided to use it for all my coding. So mm-hmm. everything I do from a coding perspective is done in Brave, and it's um, it's just a, the most responsive browser I have. Like It's the fastest browser on iOS yeah. or Android or anywhere else. You guys got to <laughs> try it if you haven't tried it. It's unbelievable. I'm putting it on my mom's machine. <laughs> yeah. Um, Blocks all those ads. So I think we're at a point where, like, now if not 24, 25, like, I, I've been thinking about standardizing on a single browser and pushing everything through that browser for a really long time. Yeah. Uh, absent a Google Workspace environment and a Chromebook situation, it's been very difficult to, to think about. Yep. And I'm not going to go the Intune route. So what I, what I want to get to is I don't want to control bookmarks. I don't want to control sort of, no. like, your theme or whatever. Yeah, I should have but, that freedom. Or your you landing want. page. That doesn't matter to me. But what matters to me is that I'm driving s- most of, if not all, of my corporate data traffic through a single right. browser, which gives me sort of that CASB forward proxy type type structure. Exactly. And still hard to do in Windows. I know, and that's the that's the big Kahuna. Mm-hmm. Like still hard to do in Windows, and um, I know that both these companies are working on that. But it's uh, when I can't get my default browser to work out of Outlook, and I have to go and do an extra setting. These are the type of things that bother me. Yeah. Like I think that it's ridiculous that I can't set a default browser, and that still <clears throat> some applications, including third-party applications, still call the IE library to load a, yeah. a web page. It's, a, it's like how can they not? It's that link ending, and you have to go into Outlook, and there's like. There's two levels down. Kate and yeah. I found it. There's a setting you've got to check the box for yeah. and change your default browser back to Chrome or back to, say, the default browser for Windows, yes. which we've already set to Chrome. But Microsoft went and changed that. Like, Well, they'll just change it ad hoc, too. It'll just change. It just changed. In the middle of, and that happened a couple times last year where it just changed randomly during a Windows update. Um, yeah. The only thing I'll say is uh, related to the, the, the browser stuff is... Also, from a, a ransomware perspective, let's just say, you know, people open a link, you want that default browser to open, and then you can kind of move away from having like a, um, like on demand, like a Zscaler yes. or a Palo Alto or something in place, right? You don't need that web protection at that, like a VPN type level. You can just all do it to the browser. If you're on Linux or you're on Mac OS, the browser always takes precedence. It opens the actual browser, it doesn't open a right. separate OS level application to, and it's just like, can we just get to that point? Like, it's that doesn't seem that hard to me. Like, how can they not? But there's there's do some tens of, of millions of lines of code in Windows OS. There's no way they can back down from that. I mean, they tried with, with CE uh, to make a lighter version, and, and that failed. There's no way they can back down out of it. So, so to separate the browser, so so Microsoft, what? I think, has become so they they've tied their browser so directly to their OS. They cannot be separated. But that's, it's now, it used to be that way with IE, and now it is truly a separate application. They just hard coded it. It is, but but at the same point, they hard coded in. The fact that you can do a Windows Office uh, second half 2022 23 update, and it will go ahead and change your settings and not look back to making Edge your default browser. Yep. That's when that happened. That's right. So. It's not totally exclusive. The AI browser. The AI browser. Because you know what I need in my browser right now? I need more AI. More AI. 
I'm okay. afraid that if I type a Google query, I yeah. wasn't thinking right. And I want the AI to fix my thinking so that I think right from now on. So I guess to sum up the enterprise browser stuff, if you are, if you're starting as a head of IT and you've got a blank slate, that's one of the things I would seriously look at. Oh my at. God, yes. Uh, get it in now, get a great user experience, it gets your security levels uh, where they need to be. And you really, I mean, and you can sleep at night. You can sleep at night, man. I like, and I have a few peers that have implemented it and we've talked hours and hours about probably how excited we are that if more people could get on this and start driving it forward, it would make cybersecurity a much it would no, it's never it, it, it wouldn't wouldn't virtually eliminate it. Wouldn't want to eliminate it, but it would get pretty damn close to making you feel a little more comfortable. Making with the world. it a non-issue, <laughs> like you be you basically be putting all the cybersecurity back on your vendors. Yep. Your cybersecurity world would be reduced to um, a window, a window that you look through, and you got to yeah. and 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 nev not to mention the hardware savings costs if you do it right. Oh God, maybe, you can you maybe. can grab any old piece of crap. Off the shelf. Yep. Pro probably your one of your biggest spends as a new head of IT at a small, small company that's getting started is going to be laptops. Yeah. Oh, and for it, sure. <laughs> for sure. And, uh, you know, and, and, and think of this also. You know, a lot of the people are going to be joining your new company. They're keeping their laptops. It costs more money to ship them back and for IT to manage everything. They wipe them remotely. They keep their laptops. They're they have a laptop already. So right. you could save all that money if you just had a, a window that could bring you into your application. Spot them five hundred bucks, and tell them to keep using their machine. They just got to download your special browser. Yeah, and you can you can do all sorts of things with it that make it about yep. your culture, your sure. company, and make it fit in with. But what you you, want. you all you nearly eliminate XDR from this process. That's mm -hmm. no longer. A, think about all the things you eliminate by doing this. Not starting with XDR, but right down the line, like. I got a huge advocate for this. If you want, we want to bring him on the show. He'll he'll tell. We could do a whole show on it. He would talk our ear off about it. But all right, so we'll talk about that offline. If we want to do that sometime, there's definitely uh, there's definitely an audience. All right, so that was awesome. Thank you for finally letting it out, letting it out, sort of letting it seep <laughs> through. That you have something to say about browsers as a service. I love it. B A A S. This guy... Enterprise browser, man. Wrote the book E-B-A-A-S. Michael. Yeah. You killed it. Good times tonight, man. This yeah, stuff is great. I love that chapter. Uh, uh, next week, we're talking things. about budget. <laughs> your budget. Speaking of exciting things. Yes. We might be a little bit more drunk next week because <sighs> it's about setting your first IT budget. But you know what? We're getting through this book together. Can we use... Me, Mike, and you. Can we use do it? To, 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 uh, to set up our it. budget from Google's do it AI do, to help us it. get through the budget chapter in fact we won't even be here we're going to just have it read it That's and right. we're going to use a sentimental but serious we'll cap, tone let's just cap cut with the TikTok videos and have it do the whole thing read over it what do you like about this new um, plug by the way I think it's got I think it's got some potential I like that I, mean, I think it's got potential